All right. Cool. And I'm also going to join on my phone so I can see the chat, so I can at least read the chat while you guys are talking when we communicate. Let me just join in. But this week was amazing. Great trading. Even though it was NFP week, it was a great trade week. Uh, no audio. Stay participant. And I'm going to check chat now. All right, cool. I can see the chat here. We got a lot of things to go over this week, man. Oh, man. I'm just so excited to start looking at this week. So let's share the screen. Welcome to Forex Friday with Deontay. Let's get a little more official. And let's get a nice screen share going on there. Yeah, we'll just do the entire screen. Cool. All right. So today we're going to be talking about the weekly range review, some yen crosses observations, um, January's Asian session model results. So that's going to be really good to talk about and see the results are actually phenomenal. I can't wait to talk about that. Then we're going to jump into Q&A, and then we're also going to jump into a few examples to talk about how I was able to pass phase one of the top tier trading account. It was really nice to find those trades. So to begin with, we're going to be looking at the DXY, and we're just going to come to the chart and observe it in its natural form. So we always like to mark out SOP, which is going to be Sunday's opening price. It's the same thing interchangeably for weekly opening price. It's the opening bid for the weekly candle. Now, this opening bid for this opening price is fair value. Make sure. Can you guys hear me? I want to make sure you guys can hear me. Anybody could just say yes or something. Say, yeah, you're good, D. Cool. All right. We got audio. So once price gets above that opening price, that's a premium. <clears throat> and then once price gets below it, it's a discount. Once price is below here, that's where you're going to find your ideal buy conditions. Once price is above here, that's where you're going to find your ideal sell conditions. Now, we can see just looking at this week, we can see Wednesday had a strong rally out of a discount. Friday as well. Thursday had a great sell off above in a premium. Likewise, Wednesday as well. And we're going to talk about Wednesdays and Thursday and particularly the London idea or the London model. So let's look at that. So let's zoom in to this day here. I'm going to drop down to the 15 minute time frame. I'm going to bring it right back to the start of London. So this is 2 a.m. here. And in between that, we have a dead zone. We have midnight to 2 a.m. right there. So you're not looking to trade here. This is the Asian lunch. Now, the London session is 2 to 5. And we're going to be looking for some type of liquidity pool within this time period to allow us to find a potential long or short opportunities. Granted, given where we are in context in hindsight now, we're above the Sunday's opening price, and that's a premium. So ideal sell conditions can be forming here above Sunday's opening price going into this kill zone. We are also trading on a Wednesday, so we have the confluence of an ideal trading day. Now, not every single week is treated the same. Mondays, I skip. I tend to not trade Mondays. The reason I don't like to trade Mondays is because at times – you do run into that phase of consolidation on Mondays often. I don't like that. So I just avoid Monday altogether. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, that's when the midweek volume is going to come in. Those days tend to be very ideal for trading opportunities. Not to say it doesn't occur on Mondays or it doesn't occur on Fridays. Either I don't trade Fridays at all. Unless it's like NFP and I can really push it and I find an opportunity, I can't do that. But normally Mondays and Fridays is a no trade for me. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, ideal volume, midweek. This is Wednesday, and we're above Sunday's opening price. So we got that context in mind. We can also see that 
we're coming up and taking out Tuesday's previous daily high as well. So we're rating buy side liquidity. So this is Tuesday right here. That's Tuesday's high. Let's mark that out. Got a frame context around it. It's not that we're taking support and, and resistant zones, you know, or supply and demand zones. We're not doing that. We're taking specific levels. This is the previous daily high on Tuesday. That's the highest point was on Tuesday. So that's midnight to midnight. That's the highest high we had. Price comes up, takes it out right here. So it's purging, purging buy side liquidity. We go into 2 a.m. here. This is the 2 a.m. candle. And if we play it forward, just go to one minute. And I'll highlight it so you guys can see this. Pause. Let's go back to the one minute briefly. So that liquidity pool between midnight and five a and two a.m. correction is right here. So you have this sell side liquidity here at midnight, the lowest point here within that time period. We also have this swing low that's rated. Now at this point, could there be a buying opportunity here? Yes. There could be a potential buying opportunity. But because let's say we're in the context of being above Sunday's opening price, we really want to only hunt for sell setups. Or that's the likely opportunity that we can have because we're overbought and expensive. So let's say we skip this buy idea for now. Right? We could go down one more time frame and check that out later. But let's say we skipped that idea and we went for a sell opportunity. We would need to see what happened. Buy side liquidity taken. So we already got the context of Tuesday's high being taken out. We also have buy side liquidity above this swing high formation here at 2 a.m. itself. That 2 a.m. candle. Let's play it forward. Ooh, way too fast. Price comes up and takes out that buy side liquidity above 2 a.m. Right there. We also have the opening price of the session. So that's 2 a.m. It's the same thing we were just speaking about. There is a fair evaluation. It's opening bid. You're not paying a premium or a discount. If price moves above that price point, it's in a premium. And if price moves below it, it's going to be a discount. We could see it moved into a discount and it found a, a buying opportunity to run back into a premium. Don't over don't overthink it, but just look at how it's forming itself. It drops down below 2 a.m., takes out some type of sell side liquidity, and then it rallies right back up to opening price and then beyond that. And then at this point, we're getting back to buy side liquidity. We still have sell side residing down here. We also took out the previous daily low. I mean, previous daily high. So we could be aiming back down to some type of sell side liquidity pool, the previous daily low. If it was possible, right? If this was a projection and we would assume that it was going to sell, let's see if the daily draw would be the previous daily low. That would be, an, uh, that would be a level of projection. And it's not like I'm picking a random zone. Like I'm saying, I'm picking a specific price point. I'm picking the low, the previous daily low. If you go down to one minute to view what's going on after that buy side liquidity is taken, we can see, look at the formation above that 2 a.m. candle or that swing high via 15 minute. We can see price comes down. Create some type of fair value gap here. Creates another fair value gap here. Notice this fair value gap lands on the opening price as well. Let's draw it out from here to here. Sorry if it sounds like it's getting really quiet. I'm muting it because I'm sneezing. I don't want to get it in audio. So we got the fair value gap here. Price is coming up and then coming down. But we're leaving what? A premium. So the idea normally is that I'm looking for a swing low for the entry technique to be broken with a fair value gap. We do get one. We get one right here. 
But notice how this fair value gap is below London's open. I don't really want to sell here. It's not the ideal case scenario, but it is still an opportunity. But I would be selling at a discount. The most ideal sell opportunities is above the line open and plus after it's taken out buy side liquidity. And you can see our price respects this fit right gap and then sells over. But that would have been an opportunity potentially to go short in a premium. That was the closest one available as price was going down and coming back in. That would have been the closest entry you could have taken before going short. Or it would have been the next higher fair value gap. This one here. But here we're forced to sell in a premium. So some people have a problem of understanding the concept of when to sell and thinking that you're always going to have to sell in a premium. No, that's not true. I'm just saying that it's ideal. It's preferred. But setups like this do unfold like this. Price trades back into that fair value gap. And, in, and a little beyond that as well. It even has a candle that closes above it. So there's people that will argue saying that if a candle closes outside of the fair value gap, that means it is a strong stance that it's not going to respect it. That's not true all the time. I think there are definitely other scenarios where it does close outside the fair value gap and it still sells off. We see that many times. And you can see how it sells off. But notice how it's so sensitive to this price point here. 2 a.m. It's threading the needle. That's what I like to say. It's threading the needle back and forth of the opening price. It's in a premium. Then it's in a discount. Then it's back in a premium. Then it's back in a discount. Then it's back in a premium. Discount. A premium again. And then it's gone. That premium opportunity, now that the algorithm and the market makers have decided on where they're going to take this market, because they already know where they're going to take it. If they're going to take it lower, they're going to find their shorts above 2 a.m.'s opening price. Every single time. Excuse me, guys. I just, I need, really need to blow my nose. I apologize. Give me one second. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. Thank you for your time. The best opportunities come in a premium, but here you can see we would have been forced to sell in a discount here. You can see how the market still respects it, but notice where the algorithm in itself is pulling the price action. It's almost as if they always get the best price possible because it is true. They always get the best price possible. The algorithm is never wrong. It's purposeful. It's meaningful. It's methodical. It's not going to pull itself up here for no reason. Where it, where it moves itself is a logical standpoint every single time. We may not understand it in its realm of, of current time. We're watching it live. We may not understand it right there and then. But when we look back and use hindsight like this, it allows us to get exposure to certain fluctuations. And this is what we see time and time again. This small little setup like this. Price brings retail traders, let's talk about it in this way. Price brings retail traders up. Some some probably bite on this for a breakout or something, right? Some retail traders fall for that bite. They break out. Then it sells on them. So it feels like, oh, the market's against me. So what, what do traders do? They go short. Then they're waiting a bit, and then they're getting greedy, and they're holding for a very long time, you know? Or they're getting a poor entry in general. Then it pulls price right back up again. It finally raises that buy side liquidity pool or where people have placed their stops above this high. They run the stops above that 15 minute swing high. And then there they go. That's where they're going to find in hindsight. Now we can see that this was their peak selling opportunity to get retail traders long again. So it's almost like two fake outs in this move. When you look at it, fake traders short, then fake traders long and then pull it back short for the rest of the session. So it's crucial to understand these little things. These, these opening prices 
and these levels as in its sense of sensitive um progress to current price action is very interesting when you see it it's not something that i can make up you see this all the time that's the open of 2 a.m london open look at how price is trading around that level it's a very inter interesting thing and then price comes down after finding that sell opportunity inside that fair value gap it sells all the way back down to what that 15 minute low right back down to it that's an opportunity that's a that's a great day trade don't let anybody tell you a trade like this is not a great day trade. What you're seeing is a great day trade. It may not have met your expectations for where you want it to sell, but it's still a possible scenario. I'm not telling you to exclude it altogether because there will be moments and times where you will be forced to sell in a discount. Hopefully that makes sense to those that are still trying to figure out and grasp that sometimes. We would wish, of course, to get the sell up here, but sometimes we don't, we're not allowed that entry. We're just not allowed that entry. And you see large sell-offs like this. Price sells that all the way down and it creates a swing low. And then it breaks that swing low with a fair value gap. Bearish momentum. Let's take a look at another day. And if we were to play that day out, let's just play it out. Look at that sell-off. And it gets all the way back to what level? That's Sunday's opening price. Very interesting, right? Why does it hit this price point here and turns all the way back around? Yeah, we may may say that there's a fair value gap here too. Right? We have a PDA right here. This huge busy buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency. That could be a reason too. But I want to talk about it from a level aspect. This specific price point here. 103.47. Price is turning around right there. That's interesting. And if we play it out for the rest, look, and then price, oh, wow. And ever since from that setup, it takes out what? The previous daily low. So when you kind of reverse engineer and you try to figure out how the price get from this previous daily high to this previous daily low, and you watch it unfold, you see how the market is going to target liquidity in specific ways. It did it during London. Then it goes into New York session. And New York session probably gives small but little opportunities to go short. And it sells off. And let's take a look at this New York session. Because some people may be wondering about that too. And I think this is going to answer a question that someone had in the chat. It might not take another example I believe is going to answer that person's question. And you guys will see as we talk, as we go along and talk about it. Let's clear everything off of this for now. So let's take 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. And it's 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. So this is looking at it from the New York standpoint. This is a very simplistic idea. I'm not saying this happens every day, but you see how this is one scenario that the market gives us, and it's pretty obvious. This is sell side, this is buy side liquidity. This is buy side liquidity as well. Why? Because it's a swing high. This is sell side liquidity. Because that's a swing low. So at 7 a.m., price comes down and takes out this swing low. So it purges sell side liquidity. So it drops below the opening price at 7 a.m. Meanwhile, we're still above. Uh, did I clear? Uh, I didn't. Ooh, I cleared everything out. Shouldn't have cleared everything out. That was a bad idea. Copy. All right, there we go. To 10. There we go. 
So we got the buy side and sell side liquidity levels drawn out. Notice we're above right where Sunday's opening price is. This dash line here, that's the weekly open. That's the weekly opening price. Look how price hits it and then runs away. Look how it hits it here during the day. And then it runs back up. This is around five. This is around the end of London. And there's a deep retracement going into what? The dead zone. Deep retracement. Yeah, at, at times you'll see this. Price is retracing back up from that sell opportunity. This can make people psychologically want to jump out their shorts because it, it pulls them back and it puts them underwater. And it's also doing what? Breaking swing highs right here. This buy side right here on a 15-minute time frame right there. And then price raids it. When we look at price here, it's going on in one minute. Price comes down, sell side liquidity taken. Look at how it trades all the way back up to buy side. Purge revert. We can see some PDA raise here via one minute, right? We got that volume imbalance. These candles are not touching. Now, these are, these are not PDA rays I, I, I talk about often, but we can see them in price action. We've got the volume imbalance. Candles are not touching, so this is technically an, oop, the whole thing. Technically inefficiency here. So price what? Rebalances that inefficiency. There's also a fair value gap in, in there too as well. So there's a lot of confluences here. So that could be a buying opportunity there. And it's doing it where? Where is the algorithm specifically placing these fingerprints? below 7 a.m. after taking up buy side liquidity and also dropping down below Sunday's opening price. So it could be gaining sponsorship buys weekly. It dropped below the weekly open and now it's moving back above the weekly open. Very sensitive price point here. So there could be sponsorships of buys here coming into the market. The big dogs are stepping in and buying right here at fair value because it's not a premium anymore. It's either fair value or it's cheap and they push price back up. Within this PD array, you can see how it just respects it and then goes higher. And it also prints other continuations, right? If you were looking at this and you're trying to pyramid this, another PD array forms here. You would potentially think that it's going to hold up with that PD array, right? That's the, that's the guess that we're taking that this PD array is going to hold it up for us to pyramid or stack into this opportunity, especially after breaking swing highs here again. Swing high broken, fair value got formed. Okay, let's see if price respects it. Trades higher. But we also have a bullish order block theory. Yeah, we do. We have down close candles, right? This down close candle before this rally up, price trades back into it, respects it. And it's a large body candle too. Price trades into it and it runs higher. That could be another position where you're stacking your trades. And there could be a plethora of other PD rates that I'm not mentioning here that you may be, you know, educated on and those are entry techniques you would probably take as well so it's not always one way it's just that i'm showing you what i prefer that's just the, the main point you're looking at it through the lens of deontay's eyes but i know there's thousands of you guys watching or a couple hundreds of you people watching that may prefer something else and i don't mind that i don't disagree so here we take out that buy side and watch let's keep playing play it all the way through Look at how price is setting itself up to go short in a premium above the 7 a.m. opening price. So think about the quality of your trade. This is why I try to say that entry is really important. Where you're selling is really crucial because you can mitigate a lot of risk if your entry is just so much better. Sloppy entries do not make for great risk trades. They just don't. You want to get the best price possible. You're not always going to get it, but you're going to get very close to it possibly. You want to take as much risk out of it. If you had to sell, you would have to sell above 7 a.m., including weekly open too. You want to sell above both those price points. And then price trades away. In this sell-off, let's take a look. Right. We can see how it just sells all the way down. Price then creates multiple fair value gaps. We got one here. 
play this one right here. It creates a liquidity void too, right? There's many ways you can look at this. This is the last up close candle before all these candles drop. So we went through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven down candles. All eleven candles closed down. The last up candle here and here, you got a void. You got a void here and here. This price too. Price comes in and fills that void. That liquidity void. Because it's all one-sided liquidity. Fills that. So there's many ways you got, you could look at it. It's not that I'm sitting here saying, oh, you can't look at it this way. And I don't want to point out every single way because I don't want to confuse you folks. That's the whole thing. The more you know, the more... Ah, sometimes the more you know, the more you can be... You know delegate your attention to one entry at a time you look at you can get so many things so it's so confusing you're like what about this liquidity void what about this pd rate what about this what about this there's only got to be a few of those you got to be looking at mainly for and you want to specifically take if you're looking at every case possible for this entry it's going to be pretty difficult because you're going to be unsure about when i should be getting in when it's your time to see that entry and the crosshairs line up you take the entry and see how it works and how it performs for you based on that entry technique. Based on it. Take your time. And price sells off. And tackling. Let me see that. It's all the way down here. Price continues to sell off throughout New York session. Taking out the previous daily low. That's London. Let's take that off. I don't even want that one. Yeah, that's Tuesday right there. Look at that. Tuesday's low. All that coming from out of New York session. Clean lows on the lower time frame you can see here. Very relatively equal lows. Retail traders are bad, of course. Trend line, right? You're going to see them draw these things that don't make any sense. A trend line. So you got to be focused on these small ideas. You're informed. And I know you're informed because you're hearing it from me and I wouldn't want to steer you down the wrong path personally. I, I really wouldn't want to steer anybody down the wrong path. If I don't know something, I won't speak on it. Point blank period. But if I know something, I will speak on it to the best of my experience or the best of my knowledge. And if I'm wrong, I would always come out and say, yo, I'm wrong. I got it wrong. And we move on. So that is Wednesday. Let's look at Thursday's London idea. And I'm going to go through another pair. We've got a few pairs to go through. But you got to be exposed to these ideas over and over and over again. We're in a 15-minute time frame. It's Thursday, right? Another ideal trading day. This is 2 a.m. And let's get 5 a.m. in there. 5 a.m. Let's bring it back right here. Can anybody tell me what this is that I'm marking off? Is this a buy side liquidity or sell side liquidity? Anybody in the chat? So congested. If anybody could just type real quickly, is it sell side or is it buy side? Just let me know what you guys think this blue line is representing. Is this buy side or sell side? It is midnight opening price too. That's true. That's true. I should have asked this question more specifically. That's a great answer, you guys. If this is the Asian lunch session and we're looking to find liquidity pools, thank you. Great answer. It's sell side. That's the answer I was looking for. It's sell side liquidity. Great answers for the other ones. Good eye. This is midnight opening price as well. Good eye. Well, let's just say we're looking at it from the standpoint of this simplistic idea of using this dead zone as buy side and sell side. This is sell side as well. And then this would be buy side because it's the highest high that we have within that time period. So we're going to use it. That's why we're going to take this, this level here. We're going to use that level. We're also going to mark off 2 a.m.'s opening price. So we're trading into London. We need to understand the opening price ideology. Anything above here is a premium. Anything below is a discount. Let's go forward and see what side we purge. 
we purge what? Buy side. So we're expecting most likely, because in my mind, I like to play the turtle soup idea because it's one scenario out of the dice that the algorithm would roll and give traders. And it's something that happens very often. And I like that setup and I like that scenario. So that's why I tend to look for this simple idea. All I'm doing is trying to be counterparty to everybody just wants to go along. I know it might be a weird idea. Like, why do you only sp stick to this? Because it works. It literally works. I don't change it because it works. It is one proven fact that this is a scenario that happens in the marketplace. This just one. And this is the same one I've been talking about for a very long time. Being counter, the retail traders breaking out. Buy side is taking. Retail traders are thinking break retests. They could be right. Remember, the algorithm may roll that scenario for them and allow them to get that opportunity. Traders that have took that side of break retest and the algorithm rolls its dice and it comes out to be break retest, they win and I lose. But when I take that stance of being counter to them and the algorithm rolls the dice and it gives me that scenario of a false break, I win and they lose. That's all it is. I'm just taking a side. And I like the side I take. And I think it's an easier thought process as well. Instead of trying to predict a break retest. I'm so congested. I apologize, guys. I know I sound very funny. Price breaks that 15 minutes swing high. We're to an opening price. And we can see here. Wow. So congested. Where's our entry technique? Right here. Fair value gap. You need some vitamins. <laughs> I need vitamins and sleep, my friend. I need more than just vitamins. I appreciate it. Fair value gap runs through that swing low. We would look to go short here, and we would set a certain risk parameter. Now, I don't trade the DXY, but if we had to put one in, I know this is definitely going to have to say 115. Yep. 15. So this would be a one-to-one -one scenario idea for the DXY. When we get into the pairs, we'll talk about the stop loss placements and how large I like to place it. Notice how many times it's, it's, it's holding itself in a premium over and over again. Yeah, we, yeah, we hit TP. I don't know why I'm still playing it. TP hit. It didn't get to our sell side liquidity, though. See? This is another question some people ask. Does it always have to get back down here? No. We're just trying to take an opportunity to get at least back to the open. That's really a general projection I have. Trying to get back to the opening price for that first counter setup. If it's going to sell, we would like to expect or take an educated guess that it's going to at least get back to the London open. If we're selling, and vice versa, if we're buying, if it went the other way. So imagine this same scenario, but reverse. That's why I don't like to try and predict which direction the market's going to go. Because I believe that retail traders are the scapegoat to the market. They're always going to be brought in and they're going to chase. Chase it like candy. Chase, oh my gosh, you know, of this. It's going up, so let me buy. It's going down, so let me sell. You don't want to do that. It seems a lot more gullible. I don't want to be gullible. I want to be on the right side. Buy side is broken there. Andrew Technique Forbes, and I'm looking to go short.
And that's it. Then we leave London. And that's a London trade idea. That's a good day trade. Don't let somebody tell you that this is not. This is one of them. This is a great day trade. I don't care what anybody tells you. This is a great day trade, guys. Most people can't even get this. By the time they get down here, they've already blown their account because they couldn't even think properly through all of this. They couldn't even think properly through all of this. Come on. By the time price got down there, they would have already blown their account. They've already had been taken upon the roller coaster of emotions many times. Is it is it is it selling? Oh no, is it buying? Is it selling? Is it buying? Is it they've all they're confused. There's people out there. And it's okay if you are one of those people. As you go along and you start to trade and get more experience and you take what I'm telling you, you'll start to understand the quality of those trade entries need to be on point. There's no way people are going to be able to risk three, four percent when they're selling in a discount. It just doesn't make sense. Why would I ever risk three, four, five percent of my account when selling down here? I would definitely rather risk three or four percent up here if I was actually going to be a risk taker and be more aggressive on the market. If I had to sell down here, the risk is going to be cut by half or even more than half. And then I take the trade idea. So you got to be wise about when are you risking? If you want to have the confidence to take trade ideas like this, it's not that I sat here on Thursday and I witnessed this myself and took this. I'm just going back and showing you an example of how this unfolded. How do we arrive to this sell-off? It all starts with this storyline here. I don't see a lot of people talking about it this way, but it's something I've noticed over the years. So do not allow people to tell you that that's not a great trade idea because it is a great trade idea. I want to be countered everybody. People tell them they tell me they're going to buy, I'm going to sell. People tell me that they're going to sell, I'm going to buy. Because I know the algorithm most likely will give me that opportunity to actually say hey, you were wrong. I can turn around and tell other traders they were wrong. Not in a mean way, but just to say like, hey, look, I went opposite to you and I still won. But you had all the conviction in, you know, retail pattern or algorithms or not algorithms, indicators to try to get to that idea. So let's jump on to AU. Crazy man said I need vitamins. That's so funny. I keep looking over and looking at that comment. Yo, you're funny, man. So looking at this from the one hour. Man. You can see how prices in a premium. And there's a major sell-offs in a premium. And we can also see on the flip side, there are opportunities to buy at a discount. Now Every time we did see price touch Sunday's opening price, you can see there was some type of strong reaction here on Tuesday. Look how price Tuesday hits Sunday's opening price. Boom. It runs, turns right around. Here again, hits it again within that same day. Hits it, does trade on below it for a couple couple hours, and then finally runs back up during London right here. Runs all the way back up. London made the low for the true day kill zones so london and new york most people are not going to trade after here so open high low and close happened really early but then the rest of the day gave back its gains it took out the low you can see here thursday new york post price all the way back up london close continuation pattern all the way back up to friday nfp so we're going to talk about an nfp idea here so let's go into thursday And we're on a 15-minute time frame. So this is going to answer this question in the chat. Let me just go back to the chat real quick. Someone had a question. I'm going to read it out loud. So it says, when trying to employ the New York model, after marking out the swing highs and swing lows between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m., if price still forms a swing high and swing lows before 8 a.m., can you still make use of them? 
This also goes for the London model. And the answer is yes. And you're going to see this example what I'm talking about. Now, I wouldn't include... I wouldn't say just 8 a.m. I would say if it happens in general before um, the end of the session, it's still a feasible liquidity pool, especially via 15-minute time frame. So let's walk through this New York idea here. So we've got 5 a.m. here, and we got 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Let's take this off. So the whole idea of what I've been studying is this dead zone, right? A small period in time between the kill zones that we, that everybody knows about. You're taking the liquidity pools between this to help you probably gauge an idea here. And oftentimes we can see time and time again, it does help gauge to give us an idea. It's exactly what I show you guys for the Asian session model. Buy side, swing high. Sell side, swing low. Let's play it forward. That's 7 a.m.'s opening price here. Let's go back to the chat. Okay. Price is either going to break buy side or sell side here. Let's play it forward, see what happens. So you can see right here, there is a buy side, sorry, a sell side liquidity pool that forms within the New York session. Right here. That is a sell side liquidity pool. It forms during the New York session. And it's happening below 7 a.m. as well. So it's in a it's in a discount. Price is now currently in a discount, trying to break what? This swing this swing low. Let's play it forward and see what happens. Price breaks it. Could we use this idea? As an opportunity to go long, yes, we can as well. Not to say we 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 are supposed to get back down to this low, because at times it may not want to target this low. Right? I'm not the algorithm. I don't know which low it's going to want to specifically target. But if I know sell side is being created, I know the market does two things. It creates liquidity pools, and it breaks liquidity pools. And after breaking a liquidity pool, it normally makes a great, a great move or a great deal and change the direction at times. And it could be happening here with the context of price potentially going higher after taking out sell side liquidity. Let's play it forward. Quick large move back up to buy side. Where does this buying opportunity happen? Below 7 a.m. opening price. Hold on one minute. So that's that 15 minute swing low. Look how it's clean lows and engineered. The algorithm is engineering these lows specifically because hindsight tells us that it was engineering these lows. Why? Because after taking out this low, it made this low. Then a couple minutes later, right? About an hour later, price comes back to that same low and then makes its decision making process to turn around and go up here. So it had to have known that it was going to run this low level here in the future. It already knew what it was going to do, right? We're trying to think intellectually about intellectually about this. Price is most likely going to make a liquidity pool run it and then make a decision of, am I going to run away from this and take sponsorship for those that have sell side liquidity below here, sell stops, whoever was buying here. Most likely has a stop loss down here below the low. Price runs it and then it goes back up. They engineered it. They got people to buy and look for price to go higher sooner than when it was going to do it. So it runs up and then it looks like the market's against all the everybody that got it right. It stops them and then it goes the right way. Then these traders are upset. These traders that caught the longer upset because they knew it was going to go higher, but the algorithm had one more sweep before going higher. So you got to be careful. That's why I like to take my time. I'm very patient for my entries. The session, the session will go on, and sometimes the entry does happen early. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it happens later in the session, right? The last two hours of the session, the entry occurs. Most times you like to see it happen after 8 a.m. or 8.20 or 8.30 for the New York session. 
And that's when that turning point happens. Around, around 8.30, the entry technique unfolds. 15-minute swing low is broken. You got a fair value gap. That's mostly, think about this, that's mainly in a discount. Actually, the whole thing is in a discount. My eyes are just fooling me. Look at that fair value gap. It's in a discount after breaking a 15-minute swing low. So you can use liquidity pools that are made inside the session as your sponsorship as well to potential longs. You counter those retail traders that are probably going to break out below this low. I said you went long. And we saw it. We knew it we were going to go long because we got the idea, the fingerprint. It's giving us a clue. This is the natural price action clue. Price breaks multiple swing highs. Well, these are double bot these are double tops, which is also significant. Well, three swing highs here, excluding this one. Two. The price runs right through it. What is this? We would call this speed, right? Those who are familiar with earlier ICT core content stuff, this would be called speed, right? Those videos Michael was trying to tell traders, look for the speed in the market. When X, Y, and Z occurs, what occurs? Sell side is rated. Speed comes into the market. It's like, oh, this is that very beginner level stuff that ICT was telling people to look out for and study. What, what to do as a new trader? This is what you're looking for as a new trader. You're looking for moments of excitement. It's pretty simple. You're looking for dynamic movement, especially these large ones. These are about very obvious ones you start to see. And then you'll start to see the nuances of these footprints and fingerprints. Sometimes they're smaller than this, and they're very subtle. And it happens so quick, and nobody sees it. It catches everybody off guard. It could have been a fair value gap that was so small like that. And it was right through that one swing high. And then price trades up, trades into it, and it's gone. But this one is very obvious. It's it's yelling by. Yelling by. Look at that speed. Me and you cannot buy Australian dollar versus US dollar and make this market move. It's impossible. If we took everybody, if we took all the subscribers I had. Or all everybody that's in the channel and everybody that's in the Zoom chat right now in this live call right now, and we all brought AU right now at the same time at eight thirty. At that candle, it would not budge. It would not be us that's doing that. What else? Who has large funds and contains or controls majority of the liquidity pool is going to move this. They have their hand in this. They could turn the whole wheel upside down many times if they want to. It's all algorithmic now, of course. They don't have to be there to do it anymore. But we can see, there it is. The algorithm that's coded, ones and zeros, it's all coded. It's all ones and zeros, and it's giving list of commands. That's the assumption that we're, we're thinking underneath, right? The, the methodology or the ideology, the belief system, because it has to be a belief system to how you're trading. And the belief is this thing is rigged. And we know it's going to give us probable scenarios. So let's pick one or two probable scenarios and let's run with that. We don't have to predict every single scenario. That's the downfall to a lot of traders. We don't need to know every single scenario. We just need to know a plethora a handful of scenarios, and pick one or two that we love to identify the most. How simple is that? It's very simple. This is the one that I like to identify and show the community over and over and over again. I sound like a broken record. The content looks all the same. Of course it's the same because it's not broken. I'm not here trying to show you 50,000 ways to trade. I want to show you one efficient way to trade, and that's it. Because this is the way I do it. Price creates that buying opportunity here. Where? Below 7 a.m. That's crucial. Crucial. You see how your buy, you start to see how your buys are more quality. Quality trades. Instead of waiting and buying here. You're not buying here. 
You're always looking to buy down here. If you ever want to think buy, try to get the buy below. Yes, there's going to be times you're going to be forced to buy up here. And it will work. And there will be times where you thought you were forced to buy up there. But price actually has other plans. You could have took a, a, a buy here. And it could have continued going higher. But here, the market didn't decide to do that this time. It allowed for a cheaper buy opportunity one more time. And it went off. Let's move on to another example. So the NFP example. Here we go. It'll bring it right here. Let's go to 15 minute time frame. You can already see look, you can already see it. Because I've been showing it so many times. You can already see it. Look at look at it. What is it doing? Up and what is it doing? Look at the time period in between. Right here on NFP. Phew, gone. It's gone. I have to take it out by side. Runs right down the south side. Clean lows. Look at the algorithm. Engineers, these lows in London. Phew, right there. Purposely made these lows. To get retail traders to buy. The think it's supply and demand. Comes down. Oh, let me buy right here. No, nope. see you later. Let's look at this. So you got five to seven to ten. Here we go. Fifteen. We're looking for buy side or sell side. Buy side liquidity. Sell side liquidity. Why? Because that's a swing low and that's a swing high. It's also the highest high too. And this is also the lowest low. So definitely significant. We have a swing low here. One, two, three. Not confirmed. But it is still a swing low in definition. We got the opening price. Let's play it forward. Price comes down, takes out what? Sell side. So let's see what happens there. Let's observe, let's observe what happens right there. Takes out sell side. See if there's any fingerprints that the market gives us. Got a small fair value gap, right? Got one right here. Right? The very first one that forms after taking out that. Let's say we're taking it from the idea of last down close candle, engulfing candle. Let's take let's say we're thinking about this. Okay. Let's take the let's take the open up, open that candle. All right. Take the open order block theory after taking it out. See if price trades higher. Pulls this back in. Let's say we take some drawdown. Let's say we're stopped, if anything. Let's say we're stopped again. Whatever the case may be, let's say we, we are stopped. Because the other day, someone had a six-pip stop loss, and I was kind of confused. I was like, all right, six-pip stop loss is pretty tight. No. Unless you really are sure that the market is not going to run six pips down. Think about that. Six pips down is nothing. Running six pips down, let's think about this. It's nothing. Price can run that. And as we play it all, we're going to see how easy it can run that. Price comes up. That buy side liquidity. But look at, look at the formation of how it's getting to this buy side. Right? Let's reverse engineer it. How did it get to this liquidity pool up here? What did it do? First, it took out this liquidity pool. Even one, let's say on one minute, because we can see a lot more, a little more data. It took out this swing low. There's a liquidity pool below this one minute swing low. So we're getting very detailed oriented. I'm not trying to cherry pick every little thing, but just look at it. What is it doing? Rating lows before it gets back to highs. Ideal scenarios is 
breaking a low, then buying. You can see how it respects down candles eventually, right? Down candle, price trades up, trades back into it, order block theory again. It's even still within the range of that very first order block that we, we pointed out. That's why I said you got to open up the stop loss. You can't have a tight stop loss right below it. Open it up a little bit. Because price may, you may have it right. You may not have the best entry where it's going to turn around, but it might be a very reduced risk entry because you're buying below 7 a.m. already, and it's after breaking this low. Price trades up higher. You can even see, look at that similar fingerprint. This time it happens in a premium. But look, swing high broken. What the favorite value you got? Price trades into it. Look at how dynamic it hits it. Creates a higher swing low in it. One, two, three. Swing points like to form inside PD arrays. That's a tip. You see it a lot on the daily. Price runs up. Taking out buy side. Let's get rid of this. So we got 830 coming around, right? The NFP. Settings. Economic events. Right there. Come from payroll and unemployment rate. Ooh, pack day, right? Volume. Price is trading. Trading. Boom, 830 hits. And it's gone. It's gone. It gives no opportunity. It's just shorts right away. No opportunity. But if we look at this just prior, just prior to that sell-off, it already started selling. Look at the very first fair value gap that it forms after breaking that liquidity bull. And that's from the 15-minute time frame. So I'm taking this off of the 15-minute time frame. That's that same 15-minute time frame when it gets up right here. 15 minute. There it is. That same 15-minute time frame. Boom. Runs into it. Let's go back to the one minute. There it is. Press trades up into it. Now, this used to be my, when you watch the New York model on my page, this is the entry technique I believe I'm talking about in that video. And I think I made that video in 2022, if I'm right, or 2023. Price trades up into it, and it gives a short. Now, I really like to look for the opportunity where the fair value gap is breaking a swing low. Like I said, this could be an entry technique that you like to, and then you can take. It's still a feasible idea. At times, I just don't believe in it sometimes. And that's just the luck of the draw. I chose a different entry technique. You see how here, another fair value gap, price trades into that one, respects that one, trades lower. Two up close candles here. Look at how price trades back up into that two up close candles, bearish order block theory. Say we take the open of that large bulkier candle. Now, obviously, like I said, this is hindsight, but when you look at it, you're like, wow, look at how it unfolded. Look at the way it got to this move down here. And it sold all the way down. But where did it find its where did it also find the selling opportunity above Sunday opening price? SP. The weekly open. Very fast, right back down to the open. Interesting. It is. Very interesting. Now, I was going to go on for gold and UJ. And we'll get back to UJ, but I want to move on to the next topic. I feel like I'm kind of lagging here. I don't feel like I, I don't want to rush things, but I feel like I'm behind schedule for some reason. Let's jump on to the next topic. So we're going to talk about some observations we had with some yen crosses. So you guys know that I'm tracking um, AJ for the month of February so far. And I just want to talk about some things about Japanese yen. So Japanese yen in itself, we go to the futures of it. In recent time, we know that it's a very weak currency. You can see it even sold off today, right? You see a huge sell-off, just like all the majors, EU, GU, AU, um, AU, huge sell-off, yen as well. We saw dollar rise. UCAD rise, you Swissy rise, UJ rise. You saw all those rise. Gold dropped heavily. We saw all those things today on NFP. So you can see the trend is still unfolding. 
if we look at this, let's go on the highest time frame. What is yen? What has yen been doing since 2012? Declining, declining dramatically, very bad, really bad. Now, do I think yen is ever going to make a return or a comeback? I think not. I think this currency is is worthless now. Nobody's ever going to want this again. I could be wrong. And so that day comes, I'm proven wrong. But as of right now, I don't think anybody wants Japanese yen. And the Bank of Japan has dug themselves in a hole that they have regretted. They didn't think that their currency would devalue this much. Definitely hurts a lot of the consumers, hurts the citizens. Their dollars are worth less. Inflation is killing them. So, we can see after all these up months here, up years, correction, huge sell-offs, huge. You can see it's counter against the trend. Price is selling, one, two, three. Price rebalances a little bit, and then it finally peaks. It fails to break this high. So a mitigation occurs instead of a breaker. Breaking the high, then going short. Mitigation occurs. It fails to break this high. So what do long? What do people that are long that are going to go and draw down do? They take a short and head. Price is going to go short. So price comes down. And those people that are long, they need to go short to mitigate the losers because price failed to get to that high. But we can see overall, month after month, Japanese yen has been selling. Now, why is that? Because I said their rates. Let's take a look at that interest rates. It's a very crucial thing. And these are things I've been talking about for years. And how you're able to find mega trades. And how you can stick to a pair that is primed to move more than any other pair. Currently, the Feds have a 5.5 rate. Currently, Japan has a negative 0.1 rate. The fact that they have a negative rate, look at that. The algorithm is like showing me the recent prop firm that I'm using. They're always watching you. Always watching you. Japanese yen has a negative rate, or the Bank of Japan more specifically. Investors don't want this. So they had a negative rate since 2016. So we can see the time. So if we click it, we can see the history of what they've been doing. So we can see, geez, what a lot of free advertisement here today. We can see 20, where is it at? 206. Let me go back to double check. It starts declining in 012. So they did something that would cause 012. No, we don't have the data for it. That's interesting. I guess they didn't change the rates in between that time period. Yeah, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. They only they only were reported when they change it. Okay, so they had a negative rate since, and they haven't changed it yet. That's why we don't have we haven't seen a recent update yet. It's still at this current price point. We went from zero. We went from a positive rate, right? Positive. We went from flat, positive, right? New. This is neutral, increase, decrease, neutral, increase, increase, decrease, decrease. Decrease, decrease, and now that final decrease was really the cannon of worms for them. And now they can't get back. And now we can see year after year, yen has been depreciating. You will have those pullbacks for sure, right? You will have pullbacks. There will be expected pullbacks sooner or later. Yen will gain value again at some point, at said point, but then soon will continue to decline if this is what the higher time frame, higher time frame trend is trending for. If we had to take a look at the largest liquidity pool that we have, it would be the on the yearly chart, right? The previous yearly high and the previous daily yearly low. There's sell side below this low, and there's buy side above above that above that high. Eventually, it's going to purge one side if it's trending, unless it's going to be coming inside year. Price does not trade outside this year's range, last year's range. It stays in between the high and the low. But I don't think that's going to occur. I do think it's going to continue to trend lower and take out a low. You have relatively equal lows too. 
2022, 2023, you have those lows. You can see 2023 takes out 2022's low. So 2024, if it's trending lower, most likely it's going to take out 2023's low. So Japanese yen is dropping. Now, how can we use this to our advantage, knowing that yen is so weak? All we have to do is pick a pair that has a stronger um, interest rate than they do. And we go back on to globalrates.com. And we can look at any other country that has a higher rate and seeing what their currency has been doing when compared in a currency pair. So we take UJ, for example. What has it been doing? It's been increasing in price. The dollar is outpacing Japanese yen. If we take a look at AUD, JPY, what we're currently looking at right now, we can see it's trending for the last couple of years. The last four years, it's been trending up. Make it another fifth year, potentially. If we look at another one, New Zealand dollar versus yen, all of these are trending up bullish on the highest time frame that we have available. CAD J, trending. After this down year, 2020, kept rallying. Why? Because the Bank of Canada kept raising the interest rates. More competitive than the Japanese yen. Let's go on. EJ. Look at that. That's the last time the Bank of Japan had changed the interest rate. What's the most recent time the ECB changed their interest rate? More recent. Right? 2023. At least when I wrote it there. Let's see what's the most recent time the ECB changed the rate right there on the 14th. And it's 4.5. Right there. September the 14th. It's the last time they changed their rate. And it's positive. Look at what it has done for the pair. It's caused this to rally. Yen is depreciating. Euro is getting stronger. Do we have another one on here? GJ. Bullish. Coming back up. What is it trying to target? Buy side liquidity above a swing high. So these are higher time frame projections. This is very long term. Futuristic. I'm thinking a couple years from down the line, right? I'm trying to find these mega trades. If I could potentially start to gauge myself from being a swing trader and start to leverage my account to be a position trader, right? Once I come across equity to start doing that and I start position trading, I could take those long-term trades like this. I would expect to hold larger drawdown, of course, create to the equity I would have at that time to be a position trader. And I would try and aim for this swing high. Or this swing high in the next 20 years. If fiat currency even exists in the next 20 years. Who knows? But that's what I would be looking for. Trying to play the long-term run. Within this candle, there's what? Months. Within that month, there's weeks. Within that week, there's days. And we can find little things to help us go in the trend. So let's take a look at... U.S. dollar versus Japanese yen. I'm going to talk about this example. Care. 15 minute time frame. I had mentioned in the chat to observe the Asian session. Just look at the Asian session throughout the week and tell me what you see happens with the Asian session. And it doesn't matter if it's not UJ, it's any other pair, but there was an example I was trying to show you guys. I said, look at UJ and how it's trading. And look at how it's keeping one side of the Asian session open on what day? I, I believe it was Tuesday, if I'm correct. I think it was either Tuesday or Thursday. And I want to double check to make sure I'm showing you guys the right example here. It was this photo. It was the first. So it was a Thursday. So it was a Thursday example. So let's take a look at this. Let's bring this day back to just the Asian session. 
We have the Asian session high, and we have the Asian session low. Also, liquidity pools. Also, metrics. Real metrics. This is not a random zone that I'm drawing on my chart. This is a real metric level. Everybody can find the Asian session high and Asian session low. No matter what broker you have, you have a real metric. Going into this, we can see the Asian session high is rated. That's buy side liquidity. But what do we have left? We have sell side liquidity left below. So price runs all the way up here. And then price comes all the way, right? So I get forward. Back down to sell side liquidity. Price is trading from one side of the market to the other side. Notice how price also raids 15 minute swing high during London. Here. Notice how London also gives a selling opportunity here on Thursday. Let's take a look at that. After taking out that buy side liquidity pool in Asian session, very subtle ideas that we're talking about here. Even if we had to include the lunch period in between, we still have liquidity pools being rated to the upside, buy side, not sell side. Let's go down to the one minute. This is the two hour opening price. And we're in London. And look, price takes out that Asian session high here. Price moves above, takes out buy side liquidity above 2 a.m., above the 15 minute swing high here. Because we can see that there is a high here that forms between here and here. So most likely it is a 15 minute swing high right here or the highest high. Price raids that as well. After raiding that, what do we get? We get this fingerprint again right here in London. Let's get rid of this. It's just 2 a.m. right there. And this is 2 a.m. right here, 5 a.m. Somebody just texted me something. So price trades up into this, and you can see how it sells off. We do in, endure some drawdown, but how would we frame this? How would we frame this? We frame it for one to one, or reaching back to some type of liquidity pool that we see on the lower time frame or the higher time frame. Let's say it's a five minute liquidity pool or a fifteen minute liquidity pool. But notice we're taking from a higher time frame. This is that fifteen minute swing high. Now we're going down to the one minute time frame. It's my favorite thing to do. Go from the 15 minute to the one minute. You hear me do that often. We go short here. Stop loss is going to be 15 pips. And profit is going to be 15 pips. Hopefully this answers another question people have. People ask me, what's my stop loss placement for a day trade? It's generally always 15 pips. I don't know why. But when I studied ICT, I've learned that the market will break certain levels or raise certain levels in the increments of 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 50, increments like that. And if I have the idea that the market it will at least run in an increment of 10 pips up to the upside, I want to be able to endure that. Or 5 pips to the upside, I want to be able to endure that from my entry point and from where the rate is occurring. So if we were to actually measure this trade and how, how high above price goes above this candle here, you can see it goes at least two increments of five, five, 10, and a little more, 11.4. So it will do it, in, and we know that the algorithm is doing it in certain, in certain increments of pips. If you've gone through ICT's material and you've come to this ideology and this belief system because I came to this and this is what I believe as well, it will do it in certain increments. Sometimes a turtle soup can happen in 15 pips. So that was a very classic way of him showing it on his channel too. There was a 15 pip um, example or multiple examples of price rating a high 
for 15 pips or rating a low by 15 pips and then turning around completely exactly at 15 pips or right around like 14.5 or 14.9 and turning around. So there's, there's levels to it. There has to be a code to how far it's going to want to run above this high to the point where it's geared and ready in whatever orders it's booked above this high, it's ready and it's enough to hit the threshold to say it's time to turn around. I don't know the exact answer to all these things, but this is one way I frame it and saying it. And we can see we get that what? One to one scenario. We go in short. Let's say you're risking 1% per trade on this. 10K account, you're risking 1% on this trade based on the stop loss and the lot size that you, you've calculated at this price point. Right, going through baby pips calculator or going through whatever calculator you would like to use to frame your risk and get your lot size, lot size, one percent of your equity. You gain that. You got a ten k account. One percent is a hundred dollars. So if you win this trade, you gain a hundred dollars. That's one setup. That's a great tra day trade. Let's say you do this five times out of the week. That's five hundred dollars. Not to say every single day it's going to be perfect. This is just a perfect and ideal scenario. People think it's always going to be per picture perfect. Your equity curve, right? The amount you gain and lose in your account, that curve and how your account grows or um, its lifespan, you'll see it's going to go up and down. You want a healthy equity curve, of course. You want your equity curve to be going up and not having heavy drawdowns and going down. You want to be a smooth drawdown and a nice recover. And then sometimes you'll have those very large impulses to the upside because you call a sweet trade where you're able to scale in, where you're able to pyramid trade, or you're able to have a trailing stop that allows you to catch a large amount of reward. And that's what tends to happen when I show you guys. Those large days that unfold during the Asian session model, those days happen where you need to be consistent enough to actually see those rewards. If you don't believe in the model enough, you're never going to catch that large setup. Let's play this all the way through to 5 a.m. Just to see. Look at what where price is. Where, look at how price is trying to trade and take out sell side. Five minutes just to speed this up. New York session comes in. Look, raids you out. Why is it crucial to pay the trader? Because of moments like this, moments like this, definitely a pullback right before the news, of course. And price runs out the high or other highs. It gets right above the A session again. You can play it forward, and then New York session finally comes down, takes out the A session low. Notice that. Within one day, pay attention to what I'm saying here. Within one day, it took out both sides of the Asian session in one day, an empty true day. So after midnight, London and New York had some type of um, relationship to the Asian session, high or low. London had a relationship with the high. New York had a relationship with high and the low. I want you to take a look at every other day of this week and see how intraday, Price is interacting around the Asian session high and low. Here it is. That's the low. Here goes the high. All within one day. Takes out the Asian high, takes out the Asian low. Doesn't take a, a, a genius to see these things. Natural price action movements are occurring around this. But we could, it's just very fascinating to see the Asian session has some type of hold on London and New York. There's something about this time period, even the New York lunch too. Central bank dealers range, you know, Asian standard deviations. There's something about this coding around this area, all of this from 12 and here, or even from a CV from London close, from London close to here to midnight. There's something about this resetting, right? The market going into accumulation within this time period. And then the gyration occurring. They're breaking the consolidation, getting retail traders on the wrong side, and then the distributing price onto the other side of the consolidation. Not that I'm trying to draw, not, I'm not trying to say that this is what it looked like every single day, but just an idea, right? 
normally within this time period, the market is going into consolidation all the way through Asian as well. There is something about this area that gauges London and New York. There has to be. Once again, look at this again. Just looking at the Asian session. Look at the relationship to the Asian session to both of these sessions, London and New York. Look at that relationship. Very interesting, right? Why is it doing that? Because it's coded. There's definitely some type of code around the Asian session or even prior to the Asian session a little bit as well, which is why others would say and presume what ICT would say, such a privilege. Open the the flout, you know, central rate dealers range plus um, Asian session deviations. You get the the flout range, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's definitely something going on algorithmically around the Asian session. That's why I was trying to tell you guys that in the channel that day, I was like, pay attention to the Asian session. It can help you formulate a trade as well. There's many things you can utilize as the day's progressing, because we know if the day's going to progress, it's going to attack. Either the high or the low. And we want to take a look at that. London attacks the low and high. New York attacks the high and low again, too. Very choppy day. Very choppy day. Back and forth. Really don't like those days, but it happens. Once again, look at this. Midnight. 8.45. Look at that. Price runs the Asian session high. London gets above the Asian session high, stays above it for a bit, sells off. New York taps into the Asian session high again, takes out the Asian session low, completely reverses. Has to be something about the Asian session that's so influential to the price action here. It's not that I'm making this up or that this is, you know, fake. It's not. It's all data you guys can go back and see yourself. Once again, look another day. Go Wednesday. Price takes out the Asian session low. London runs away from it. Asian session high up here. New York runs it again. Runs into it again. Sells off. Very interesting. So this is these small observations you make over the years, over the days, over the weeks, over the months, when you start trading. And then you start to use these ideas to help you find trade ideas or to get into that edge. Sometimes it's hard for me to explain because... You gotta been doing this for a long time for these moments to unfold. You're looking at the chart, and you're like, oh, agent session high taken. Oh, we're in London. Oh, wait, we took out buy side. Okay, this is an ideal sell opportunity. Oh, it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday as well. And yesterday was a small range candle. Oh, snap. We might get a large trade set up right here. And then boom, the trade setup happens, and then we're able to catch you know, more than 50 pips, 60 pips, and then some. And then you have those unrealized gains. So that leads me into talking about the Asian session. Um, 2024 tracking for January. So let's look at some of these results. Let's take a second and look at this. And I'm going to explain it short. So we tracked every single day that we had available for the Asian session here where I live in New York. Cause I know the days might be different for you where you live, but this is every single Asian session for January. We only out of all the, out of all the days, we got only one no entry day. One day gave us nothing. We got no entry on Thursday, but when we look at it as well, we had three stop losses that were hit throughout the entire month. Imagine that we traded this model the entire month and only three of them, three of them was a failure. Wow. Right? We talked about how certain days as well, as we start to gather this data, certain days were just way better than others for some particular reason. Tuesdays astronomical results at times look at this one unrealized gains we're going to take a look at this we're going to take a look at, at this exact example 
This is Tuesday the second. We got the entry and the stop loss, right? It's already documented. We already talked about it. We even have an Asian session library episode on it. It's already in history. You can't go back and make this stuff up. Let's go on to the chart. Let's switch over to intraday model. See, I have different I have different loadouts to keep it very concise and car um, you know separated in my mind so i'm not confused each layout is different so let's jump on to usd jpy let's go back to that's february i'm on a daily that's why let's go back to January 2nd. This was the first... Think about this. This was the first Asian session model of the entire year. The first one. The first Asian session available to us. And it gave us all of that. Let's get this on the chart. Get this going forward. All right, all right, all right, all right. So we don't count that. That Monday, even though it's open, the official trading day would be Tuesday. New Year's is a holiday. Boom. Okay. Let's walk through this together. And how did we get to this? Because some people might say, oh, that's fake. You didn't get up to 691 uh, in unrealized gains. Impossible, Deontay. You wasn't able to find that with this model. Okay. Let's, let's walk through it together. Can anybody tell me what we're looking for between anybody in the chat? Just type it very brief, quick answer. What are we utilizing this time period for? 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. What are we using this for? Let me check the chat. Range, highs and lows, 15 minute. Great. More specifically, give me a specific word. What are we looking for? Liquidity hunt. Great. Love that. Great answer. We're looking for a liquidity hunt. We're looking for some type of break on liquidity. We're on a 15 minute time frame. Let's get this shaded off now. I want you to see as well. Another day, another example. This is January 2nd on a Tuesday. Look at how this time period is consolidating. It's literally consolidating in front of your eyes within that same time period. We say this very often. Why do we not trade here? Because the market consolidates. This is one of the key points I've learned into like my third year of trading. I was like, wow, there's moments and times. False break, good answer. Yep, framing buy side is outside. Great answer, guys. There has to be a time period where you don't trade. And the same can be said about the months of the year. There might be a certain month. As you start to perform as a trader, you're going to realize some months – are worth just not trading at all live and just leaving it alone and going on vacation away from the charts and coming back another month. You'll realize that. The same thing is for a day trader as well. A day trader cannot trade at every single minute of the day from the time it opens at midnight to the time it closes at midnight. Midnight to midnight, a day trader cannot be trading the entire time because the market goes through a lot of fluctuations and there's obvious areas of fluctuations where it's really crucial for you to avoid. That's always going to be the New York lunch. There's no if, ands, or buts about this. Got to be disciplined. You break this rule, you tend to find yourself on the wrong side often. Because trading through this is annoying. I don't want to trade that. Looking back in hindsight, I wouldn't want to trade that. Just personally. I, I would. Yes, there might be an opportunity here. Yes, there might be a scalping opportunity. Yes, there may be. But I'm going to avoid that because the more I trade, the more I'm risking my equity and putting myself out there to lose. I want to trade in very little ranges if I'm a day trader. Quick. I'm in and I'm out. One session, I'm done. Two sessions might be a lot for some people. But I think if you're a day trader, try to focus and be very niche to one kill zone, whether it's London or New York, and master it. Look for the same pattern over and over again that happens there. That's how I master the Asian session. 
That's how I'm I'm so familiar with it and the nuances that it throws at me because I've seen it over the last couple of years, over and over, over and over. It's only going to give me a couple scenarios and there's no scenarios that I haven't seen yet. I've seen them all because I've been training for a couple of years now. The algorithm cannot throw any more other scenarios. I've seen every single one that is possible. And you will as well, you will as two following the same idea every single time. So we got swing low, swing low, swing high. I'm just so passionate because I, I just want you guys to understand you guys can do this. You guys can do it. I believe in you guys, man. I really do. I believe in the community altogether. Buy side, sell side. We can't take this swing low. Why? Because it's already been broken. So we can't take it. We can't take this swing high. Why? Because it's already been broken. We can't take this one either or this one. So we're not looking at that. Play it forward. You got the open. This is what? Fair value. This is the open. That's the opening bid. But as soon as price gets above, it's in a premium. As soon as price gets below, it's cheap. Play it forward. What side did we break? We didn't break anything yet. But I guarantee you, people are already too antsy. They're too hype, you know? They're too hype. They're ready to go. As soon as 8 p.m. hits, oh, I'm trading. I'm going in. It's time to make money, guys. And they, they might be and they might be betting big, you know? It's like if they're going to the casino and they're betting big on slots or they're betting big in, in blackjack or whatever game they're playing, right? They're betting big. And, they, and, they're, and they're trying to win huge. They're risking 10%, 5%, no, 6%. They're risking huge. And some come out big. But then some come out losing a lot of their money, blowing all their funds that they came in with at the start of the session. And that's not what I like to do. I wait. I wait. Because everybody already jumped the gun. But then they ha might have to deal with consolidation still, Right? It looks it looked like it was bullish. I love when people say that. It looked bullish. Yeah, I bet it does. But are you that foolish to follow it? Are you that foolish to just because it looks a certain way? Are you sure? You're not sure. So don't chase it. And we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. And boop. What is it? South side. Doesn't have to close below it. Once it runs over the line. And crosses over the line is just like American football, right? Once that football gets across the plane in the end zone, it's a touchdown. It's done deal. Once that football gets across that pylon, it hits the pylon, done deal. It's a touchdown. It's the same thing here. The football just got across the line, it's a touchdown. Team scores. So they liquidated, right? They liquidate everybody here that had a stop loss below here, a sell stop. Price going up, a sell stop to prevent selling because they were buying. So the sell stop is hit. Their stop loss is hit. Let's scale down to one minute and see what happens there. Right there. Boom. Price hits that. Let's watch it. Price comes down, 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 down. 15 minute swing low hit. Let's write it out. 15 minute swing low hit. Hits it. Bang. And then we can see, look. Instantly after it hits it, the very first fair value gap forms. This used to be the entry technique I was telling everybody about when I was still studying this model and trying to bring it to, you know, a realistic idea and something that I was still studying. I was just still trying to get used to it, right? If you go back to Asian session episode one, you hear me talking about this entry technique or episode two, I think all the way up to like episode like seven or 10, maybe that's when I changed the rules for the model for myself. Some people stick to this still, and it can still grant feasible setups. Price trades into it. You can go long, right? 15 pip stop loss, 10 pip stop loss. I go for the 15. Right there. That's my entry technique. Boom. I like this one here. That's the one I like. Let's change the color. Change it like purple or something. It's terrible. It's even worse. Let's change it red. That's the entry I would have taken, that fair value gap instead, because it breaks this swing high. Let's 
Let me double check. I want to make sure I got the entry right. See, transparency, you gotta be you gotta be real with it. Yeah, so that was the entry. Price comes down long there. Long here. What do we do? 15 pip. Fifteen pip. That's where we're going long. Entry price one forty one eight ninety four. Yep. And we went long there. And we hold. Now, even though Asian session ended here, does that mean we're done? Does it mean we have to collapse the trade? No. But if you want to, you can. That was another question. If you want to collapse this trade, you can. If you are at profit by midnight at the end of the session and you are in profit, that could be a part of your profit taking strategy. Close at whatever price I'm at by midnight. Close it. Close it. That could be an idea too. Price runs up, in if the true day, and price gives you the 15 pips. And it continues giving you more than that. You still have that buy side back in that Tuesday lunch. And look how price runs right through it. Phew, runs right through it. So we're up over 90 pips at, at this point. And that's the entry technique down there. Let's mark out that point. That price point is right around here. There we go. Let's go on the daily now, just to view it, right? Now, we know that the market was bullish for you, Jay. Like I said, at times, this model does tend to go into the trend. Same thing with London, same thing with New York. At moments at times, you'll notice that the London session, the New York session, or the Asia session is a pivotal point to continuation, continuation into the trend. That was the entry. 141894. Look at where price is from that entry. Oh my gosh. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Never came back down to stop loss. That was all based off what? That idea that we have here. That same that idea that we have here. Break the 15 minute swing low. Wait for price to break a fair value, break a swing high with a fair value, and price runs high. Unrealized gains, 691. Let's measure that. Might be higher now, but eight nine four. Right there. There we go. Six hundred and ninety one pips. Max potential so far. Because it could still could be. I'm just saying I'm not gonna track it anymore. But at the end at the end of January, this is where it got the highest point it got, so I'm cutting it off. It could continue running for February and still being in profit. This is just very unrealized gains. But now that's when you start to see how you're able to risk more because of the data. When is this happening? What day is this happening on? A Tuesday. Look at all the Tuesdays throughout the year. Sorry, throughout the month. Tuesday gives us max. Let's say 40 pips or, or 50, whatever. Right now we know the max was 691. So far, let's go to another. Two, let's go to a Thursday, twenty-five pips. Let's go to another Tuesday. Tuesday we got stop loss hit. Okay, fair. Let's go to another Thursday, forty-eight pips. Let's go to another Tuesday, stop loss hit. We'll take it. Okay, fair. Let's go to a Wednesday. Sorry, let's go to another Thursday. Only twenty pips. Let's go to a Monday. Monday happened to stand out, oddly. 134, very interesting. Let's go to another Tuesday, 14 pips. Let's go to another Tuesday. We got to stop. But you start to see that most days that tend to be more profitable was Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
it might change as the data goes as we gather more data, honestly. But as of right now, I've decided that Tuesdays and Thursdays tend to be the days that can be large days like this. Not to say Mondays and Wednesdays can't do it at either, because you can see this Monday here was very large, 518 pips. Let's take a look at that. That's on the 8th. That is on the 8th. Yep, right here. 15 minute time frame. Turn this on. And there we go. Once again, 12. Nothing changes. Play that through. Stop. Swing high. Two, two, 8 p.m. right here. 20. 20 hundred right here. That's going to be the sell side liquidity because that's the lowest low we have. There's no other swing lows that we have available that's not unbroken. Everything is un Everything is broken. So we're taking 8.15, right, technically at 8 p.m., the candle on the 15-minute time frame that closes here at 8 p.m. We're taking that as our sell side liquidity. Got our buy side up here. And that one's broken, so we can't mark that one off. So it's going to be this one. And what do we do? We wait to see what side is broken. What happens? It breaks sell side. It breaks that low. So what do we do? We go down the one-minute time frame. We're waiting for what entry technique? Fair value gap that breaks a swing high. Let's play it forward. I'm going to be sure I didn't miss it. I believe it, yeah, it has to be this one because it's the most obvious one. And that entry technique would be here. We'll double check to make sure I'm correct on that. Oh, one, nope, we're talking about the eighth. Was it? Yeah, 143.624. There it is, 624. That's the entry. See, I'm logging all this stuff, so I know. I'm logging all this stuff. So when you guys go look for the example, you're not confused. It might look a little different depending on your broker you're using. But if you want to know, I'm using OANDA on TradingView. Because if you're, if you're using something else like... FXCM, you know, or Forex.com or uh, Pepperstone or ISO 8CAP, it's going to look a little different. So I'm, I'm looking at it from OANDA. So we can see here that the entry that goes to, there goes the swing high here. It's broken right there with the fair value gap, waiting for price to trade down into that. We're going long with a one to one scenario. 15 pips for 15 pips. I'm not going 10 pips for 10 pips because there's times where 10 pips gets me stopped out very often. And I found out that having a 15 pip stop loss was the very minimalistic or minimal stop loss I needed so that I didn't have to endure more drawdown if I was stopped out. And sometimes 20 pips is also good too. Sometimes 15 to be stopped and 20 would do it for me. Play it forward. That blue line is where we got our entry. That's where we entered in. See how interesting how price is even trading around that entry point itself too. 15 pips. Where's this entry technique happening, guys? Come on. You know where it's happening. Is this happening in a discount or a premium? Can anybody in chat tell me? Where is this entry technique occurring? Premium or discount? Anybody could type it. Discount. Exactly. Once again, it's happening where cheap. That's a quality trade. That's a quality trade. That's not a sloppy trade. That is not a trade that is poor in quality in where it's being taken. That's a high quality trade. You do not have to get, like I said, you do not have to get the, the lowest low of the session. That's pretty difficult. It's pretty difficult. Yes, there might be methods to get there. But it's a very sim it's a very difficult way to get there, right? You would have to probably be on a whole nother level to predict the exact low of the session and going up, and price running back up, giving that fifteen pip stop loss. I mean TP, 
But instead, we we opted for this. We opted for a little higher of an entry, of course, because we like that entry technique. Now, many people may have brought their eyes and attention to this, as many people have pointed out to me too. They said, but what about this one? What about that one? That's an idea too. What about this one? Right? Those are all fair value gaps that happen after breaking that low. I think you have a very tiny one here. Let me double check. Yeah, really tiny one right there. Really small. Price doesn't price fails to get there. But then when you look at it in hindsight, you can see all the order block theories. Right? Just price trading down to a down candle after it's been engulfed or price ran away and broke structure to the upside. Right? There's a market break. You can see here, this last down close candle, look how price perfectly comes down to that down close candle. Hits it, put another candle here, and trades away. And then trades back into that same candle that started this. So this would be a what? A propulsion block. I am versed in ICT, right? I understand the PDA raise. You got the order block theory, price trading into it. Another down candle that trades into an order block is what? A proportion block. There you go. Another... Order block theory, ideology, price trading right back and down into that, this specific order block. So could this be a higher quality order block? Absolutely. Because it probably gets more confidence. Because price traded into one, down candle here, traded back, traded into it, rallies away. So that this down candle, if it returns back into it, price can go back into it. That is true. The proportion block, the mean. you're talking about the mean threshold. Someone in the chat had said, because I know some people can. Someone had said, should it go past the equilibrium? I'm, I'm assuming that's what EQ meant of the proportion plot. So it's the I mean, I don't care. Tomato, tomato, because every, everybody likes. Oh, it's 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 mean threshold. Oh, it's equilibrium. It's the same idea. It's halfway. It's fifty percent. And I, and I and I, some of these things really irk me. I'm like, man, it's all these fancy terms mean the same thing. Tomato, tomato, bro. Equilibrium, fair, fair value, you know, um, 50%, the midway point, all those mean, mean the same thing. You can see how price does not drop below half of that candle at 149. Yeah, there it is. That's the exact. Yep, yeah, perfect. There it is. The price does not ever get there. So your, your your entry would have to be above inside here. Everything up from this line up would be the entry. Clean. And the same thing happens again. You see multiple multiple proportion blocks here. Same thing happens again. What is this? Another down candle that lands on an order block here. All the way up here. So in the near future, what is price going to do? Probably try to trade into it. Trades into it here. With the mix-in fair value gap, goes up again, down, trades into it again, mixing with more order blocks, and it keeps going. Then you start to see how price can pyramid, and you can scale into a trade idea over and over and over again. It's still risky, though. It's still risky because there are many other scenarios that you could have looked at here, but it causes drawdown, right? It causes drawdown. You You wouldn't want that. Especially if you're trying to scale into a trade and your stop loss is not going to be the same. And the risk that you're taking is going to be a lot less. Unless you're aggressive. Right? Unless you're aggressive and you're really pushing the threshold and risking more than you should. Because you're really confident that this trade is going to be successful. And this entry that you're going to take right here and now is going to adhere little to no drawdown. That's the only reason you would risk more than you would normally do. Because you know this this entry is the pinnacle or very close to the pinnacle of where the market is not going to keep going lower or higher against your trade. That's when I would tell you you've gotten to an edge and you can start to express yourself in trying to scale into positions. If you're not there yet, don't do it. If you're not that experienced yet and you're uncomfortable psychologically, don't do it. And... If you don't know how to manage risk either, don't do it. 
takes experience. It takes time. I don't recommend traders with no experience scaling. I, I personally would, I would have annoyed myself trying. I, I've blown accounts doing it in my earlier careers. I would not recommend a new trader doing stuff like that. Just unrealistic. And that is our entry. Let's delete all those other ideas. Let's get back to our idea, my idea. Uh, without deleting everything. Here we go. Okay. That's the entry. Let's go on the higher time frame. Let's go on daily. 143, 624. That was the entry during Asian session. Let's press play. Stop loss is 143.47. Uh, 143.474.47. Jeez. Can't speak today. Can't get it to 624. Well, this is close enough. You can see how we would have gotten over 500 pips and unrealized gains. Wow. Right? Why was Asian session the turning point there? I have no idea. It just happened to be that Asian session led into this trend. Because that's a scenario and a probability that the market's giving. It is an option. And at times, it's not just the Asian session that's doing it. Sometimes it's the New York session. Sometimes the London session. And price never returns back down to where that London session or that New York session or that Asian session made that pivotal turning point. What I'm showing you here is a pivotal turning point. And it's a very significant one. Because look at what happens for the rest of the month from that entry. It keeps trending. We're able to get potential 518 unrealized gains. Day trader would probably try to take, you know, 15. Day trader's trying to take off 20, 30, 40 pips. Day trader, 40 pips is a very excellent day trade. Excellent. Don't let anybody else tell you that either. That 40 pips is not enough. 40 pips is an excellent day trade, guys. You don't have to get 100 pips every single day. Now, just looking at this data, think about you risking 1% per trade. And let's say the threshold for the 1% was 15, 15 pips. How many times did we get 15 pips or more during this month? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So let's take the idea of reaching 15 pips with risking 1% on a 10, 10K account 11 times, right? $1,100 would have been gained just off of just this simple idea of gaining 15 pips for the entire month. 1% gain each time. $100, $100, $100, $100, $100, 100 and so on and so forth. Of course, in the ideal predicament, you're going to take losses, as we can see here, loss, loss, loss. So we have three losses and one no entry this month. I don't think anything's wrong with this model. If it ain't fixed, don't, don't, if it ain't fixed, oh my gosh. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. That's why I'm not changing the entry technique. Are there ways we can modify this? Yes, of course, but I want it to be as simple as possible. I want to use as least brain power as possible. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a trader. I'm a farmer. I'm trying to use at least efforts to find setups. I'm not trying to sit here and spend two hours speculating on the chart. I don't have, I'm not going to let this consume my life. Yes, I love trading, but I don't have to sit here two, five hours out of the day. Not even five hours because I do that in Asian session. I don't want to have to sit here 12 hours out of the day. You know, I hear people saying, I look at the charts for 12 hours. 12 hours, man. You only had other things to do. Or you don't want to just relax and not hurt your eyeballs, man. Like, you got other things to do because that's January. Coming in February, we already got our first entry, right? We already went over this. I haven't put in the data yet, but we can see how it's, it, it ran up and gave us profit going into NFP, right? Let's, take, let's check that out as well. How did UJ for this NFP last night give us the amount of pips we started for February? Let's take a look at that. It was Wednesday. It was Wednesday night. It wasn't Wednesday. It was Thursday night. Correction. It was Thursday night. 
It was Thursday night where we saw, and we went through this together as a group. I don't like to do it live because I don't think there's, there's no reason for me to do it live because I think it's very simple. I don't have to live trade next to somebody to, to, to help them. I think the, the, the steps are very simplistic to all the episodes and all the examples. That's the reason I have the series for. So you can go back. And if you did it by yourself and you got it wrong, you could go back and see, oh, man. Oh, I see my entry was different. Ah, man, I see I, I used a stop loss that was too small. I could have been in that trade. Ah, oh, dang, you know, I could have took taken profit earlier. That's why I do the series for it. It's not that I want you guys to go live with me and copy the trades with me. You guys are most likely going to get the same entries if we're looking at the same exact model. And who knows how this thing will play out if millions of people are trading this idea, you know, using the same model at the same exact time. Maybe it might have an impact on the market. Who knows, you know, but this is the model over and over again. Nothing changes. Oops, should have marked it out earlier or before. Let's go like that. So this is this is the only swing high we have. And this is the swing low right there. Boom. That's that swing low. Right. Oh, I have it backwards. It doesn't matter. Blues are from my highs. <laughs> Silly me. 15-minute swing low rated. Opening price here, fam. Right there. The open. Got to use this open. It helps you. It's a guide. No indicators. Look at that. The entry happened so early yesterday. This entry happened so early yesterday. People were in the chat. I was so excited. People was like, man, I just hit 15 pips TP. I was like, that's how you do it, man. I just took 10 pips off my trade. I'm like, great. Good job. Keep going. You know, safe trading. Everybody just commenting, you know, real testimonials. Like, the model is not fake. Like It might feel skeptical, of course, you know? People might say, ah, oh, this guy is giving all, th all this information for free. No way does it work. It feels a little skeptical. Like, why would he ever give this out for free? Because I don't care about the money. It's not about the money. Everybody should be able to win. I want everybody to enjoy life, too. Fair value gap goes up. Swing high broken. Where's this fair value gap end? happening below Asian open after taking out the sell side liquidity. What do we do? We go for one-to-one -one scenario. Boom. We're in long. We're in long. Look at how price respects this PDRA, right? It really respects it really well. It respects it very well. Little to no drawdown initially off that entry. Hits it, goes dynamic. You know you're in a good trade when you go into profit immediately after taking that trade. And that's always a great feeling, too, as a trader. When you take an entry, and in like a couple minutes, you're in drawdown. Maybe like one or two minutes, you're in drawdown. And then six, ten minutes, price keeps going in. But it wasn't tapped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So somebody in the chat had said there was a fair value gap below it. See here. Oh wow. Actually, wow, this is what this is this wow. See, like I said, I'm human. I make mistakes too. Looking back at it. Oh no, actually. Ah, I thought it was. Ha. I thought it was the entry technique too. Oh, it is. Oh, ha. There it is. That is the entry technique. So there was an earlier one that happened, but I happened to see this one. Like I said, I'm not perfect. But it still aligns. It's still the same entry technique. This one happened low, happens lower. So I could have had an even better opportunity. I would have been buying almost at the exact low of Asian low, very close to the low when it gave that setup. At times, it's normally just a fair value gap. But we can see here, the very first fair value gap is also the entry technique. Swing high broken with a fair value gap. You go long here. So I didn't even see that. So thank you for pointing that out. That made me just see my entry technique as well. So you can see, I'm human too. I'm not always getting the best entry. I messed up. I should have saw this as the best entry. And I'm the one informing you about the model. And you can see, not everybody's perfect. I'm only human. And price trade away. 
But look at the drawdown. Why, man, look at the drawdown off of that entry. Or even this one that I pointed out that I took yesterday. This one was even better. Little to no drawdown. Instantly fixing pips. Instantly into profit. Great feeling. Let's play it forward. Keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. So you can see the market's still going up. What does it hit now? That buy side pool. There you go. That buy side liquidity pool hits it right there. It's not like the market forgot about it because we're going into another session. It's still a liquidity pool regardless. It's still equal highs. There's people that are selling from that high. And if you haven't taken profit on the way down or paid the trader, you will be upset by the time you come back and realize that price returned back to your entry. And you notice that you would you could have taken partials the whole way. And now instead, you're going to get stopped. That's why it's always important to pay the trader. Pay the trader. Actually... Jump on the five minute so we can speed it up. Right, London. Now we're going to Asian session. The news comes out. Boom, dollar strong. UJ flies off. Look at that. Over 200 plus pips today. And that was the result of February. We just got into February, guys. We just got into February. Starting off with a banger. What day does this occur on too? Thursday. Thursday. The trade idea starts on Thursday. Yes, it starts on Thursday, but it's still open going into Friday. But when did it start? It started on a Thursday. A Thursday. It gave us more than 40 pips. Guaranteed. More than 40 pips. Let me check that in right now. Right? More than 40 pips. How would we how would we have gotten into this? Right now, if we're doing it correct, not based on my entry, but the entry technique based on the model, right? Would be here. Entry would be here. 146, 278. So I'll come here. 146, 278. And then what would the stop loss be for that entry? Come back. I'll do it like this. Find a stop loss. Copy the wrong thing. Stop loss is here. Copy it here. See how I'm trying to be organized about it? See, I'm trying to collect my own data. I don't have no fancy EA bot or I'm paying for a bot. I could do this stuff myself. I spent enough money on a lot of things already. I don't need another bill, you know? I could do it myself manually. And there it is. And we're still what? An open, unrealized gain. So I can't put down the max. That's how I'm doing it. I can't put down the max profit because price has not returned back down into that stop loss yet. Until price hits that stop loss, then we can put a max profit in here. But if it doesn't hit that stop loss for the entire month of February, ooh we we're talking about over 600 pips again for one trade idea. Think about that. That one trade idea could be the turning point that continues to trend for the entire month. That's what happened for January. Here, this entry was basically the best price possible, according to this model. Caught. Literally the entire month. And unrealized gains, of course. If you didn't move the stop loss, right? If you didn't move the stop loss at all, and you kept it open, and you didn't take part, or maybe you took a, you take the partials in here and there, we kept something on, you still would have had this, man. Shh. Ridiculous. It's not like I'm trying to guess when it's happening. I know the data tells me that it happens on a Thursday. Most ideal to set up. And most ideal to give more than 40, 15, 30, et cetera, pips. And look at that. Sheesh. Does it never return back down to stop loss? Asian session was a pivotal moment. They all The commercials already got long way before NFP. Trust and believe they got the best entry before you did. 
But with this model, we're able to get on board with them. So we're not excluded. Not to say we always will get it right with them, but we can actually rub shoulders with the big dogs with this model. I don't have all the answers. Like I said, I was influenced by the 20 pips per, per video by ICT to find this model. And then he also hinted many, many times about stuff like this, many times. And that's that's really the highlight of the week, honestly. This Asian session model, very highlight. So if you have any questions, just let me know. I think I'm probably going to jump into Q&A. I'm going to just check the next topic and see what we got next in store. Yeah, it's Q&A now. It's pretty much talked about all the highlights for the week. Like I said, we're going to keep talking about it this way because I think it's gold. Let's see. Um, let's go back into, I know there's a few in the Telegram chat, right? So if you're not in the Telegram channel and you are subscribed to me on YouTube or wherever you are, where you follow me, Twitter, etc., Telegram chat is where I'm most active. There's only one Forensic Forex. Nobody else has this name. It's pretty unique, honestly, if you ask me, FF, Forensic Forex. Um, join the Telegram channel. Ask for the link. I'll send it to you. Comment on this video. I will send you the link. All right. So we got someone. AJ, first question in the Telegram channel. He says, I do. Actually, I could bring it up right here. Mm-mm. There you go. Ideal risk management to pass a funded challenge based on your experience in terms of risk per trade and percentage. Two, again, is it better to go with 10 pips or 15 pips as a profit target for the funded challenge based on your experience? I had these questions on my mind from a very long time, Deontay. And I know you must have heard this question earlier, but if you could throw some light again on it, it would be very much appreciated. Okay, cool. Let's bring it right back to this. Think about this being a method to passing a funded challenge account or a, a challenge account for a prop firm. Think about that. You're telling me you can't use this model based on a 1% or even half percent. Well, let's say 1%. 1% to pass a challenge. Let's take the very minimalistic rules. 10K account, very basic, right? Prop firm. Most people get the 10K account. It's pretty average one, pretty cost effective, right? Depending on which prop firm you're looking at. I know there's cheaper ones. But 10K, very standard. $10,000 of equity. They require you to gain an equity of, so it's 10, you got 10K, right? And they're asking you to get 10% of that. And 10% of that is going to be a thousand bucks. Thousand. Now to get to a thousand, how would we do that? We could risk 1%. Okay. We could risk 1% per trade. So 1% of 1,000 is what? 10 bucks. Sorry, 100 bucks. That means it would take 10 trades at a 1% risk to gain 10%. 10 trades, only 10. Let's count how many trades we have here. We don't even have to count. We have about like, what, 20 something? 20 something? One, two, three, four, five. Actually, no, I could just do it like this. 18. We have 18 days. 18 days. That's correct. Yeah, 18 days because we're not including weekends and stuff like that out of the month. 18 days. We're not including Fridays either, Sundays and Fridays. 18 days 
of profitability. 18 days of profitability. And we only needed 10 trades at 1% to get to 1,000. I think that says it all right there. Say we're risking 2% per trade. We'd pass it even sooner, if anything. It's $200. How many trades would it take you instead now? Not 10 trades, but now half. It would take you five trades to pass the challenge account. Five trades. Think about that. Risking 2% with that model would only take you five trades. 200, 400, 600, 800, and there you go, 1,000. Five trades. Say you're risking 3%. Not a big difference, honestly. But it would take you four trades, I believe. Yeah, three, six, nine. Yeah, it would take you four trades instead of five. So one trade less. Not a big difference because you're going to be gaining $300 per. Right? 300 600 900 and then 1200 It would take you only four trades to get there, to pass that. Now, think about if you're risking 4%. Now, I passed the challenge account in one day. Think about how much I'm, I'm most likely risking. Right? Pass it in one day. In one model. Think about that for a second. $400. Right? How many trades would it take you to get to 1,000 or break 1,000? Three trades. Risking 5% per trade. That's 500 bucks. How many trades it would it take? It would take you two trades. Two trades. And then so on and so forth. At the 5%, you really are just risking a whole lot, of course. But think about if I'm passing these setups, if I'm passing the, the, the challenge in one day, probably I'm, Deontay's probably risking a whole lot. But why am I doing that? Because I'm confident. Been doing this for a while. Not saying I've never lost a prop from account before or lost a, a lost a fund funded account before because of bad habits, right? I'm not perfect. I'm getting there. I'm striving towards that. I'm not the richest trader in the world. I'm not the richest guy in the world. I'm striving towards, you know, becoming better. But you can see how using this, having the feasibility of the data. And having confidence beyond your trades, you can pass things pretty easily. It, it doesn't take a whole lot. I just did the numbers for you right there and then. Like I said, we have the data here. Did the entire month to supply this, apply risk management to this, all the successful trades. Apply it, and you'll see that you can pass a profit. Now, I did it in a day. Am I telling you to go do it in a day? No, I'm not telling you to do it in a day because you might not be comfortable risking that much. But I've seen this model day in, day out. I've been doing it for, I've been trading this model. Just a question in the chat. How long have I been trading an Asian session model? I've been trading it for at least three years. It only took me about a year. I mean, it took me about two years to actually finalize and organize it to the way I like it. Because I was trading it with GU, AU, EU, and you was trading it with the majors. Right, and I was also trading it with the major the dollar, the dollar, the base currency dollars, UCAD, uh, U Swissy. I was trading it with that. And then I realized it was good, but it wasn't consistent enough. Then I figured out, oh, I'm trading an Asian session. I should, I should definitely be listening to the advice ICT said. Use the yen crosses during Asian session. So I looked into doing that with the Asian session. I started using it with AJ, GJ, EJ, CADJ. Um, Australian J. I, I've been, I was doing all the end crosses at one point in time. And then I started to, to be very niche. I started picking just AJ and EJ interchangeably. And I found one worked more than the other. And you know what? I said, you know what? Let me just try UJ because King Dollar rules over all the fiat currencies, right? So it should dominate yen every single time. And it should give me the setup. I started trading UJ with it. Hit after hit after hit after hit after hit. Back to back winners. Look at this. One, two, 
three. That's a full week of Asian. Oh no, just missing one day, a Monday. Well, you can see, we can see almost a full week. Actually, yeah, we technically did get a full week because we got a, going into a Monday. So we got a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday. Basically, a full week of Asian session models. All winners back to back on NFP week. On an NFP week. That trade setup we had today was NFP week too. That first Thursday. That Thursday. Even that. What is that? I think it was a Wednesday. No, it wasn't. Was it a Wednesday? I'm trying to see. Was there a Wednesday that was really strong? No, it was a Monday. If I can remember. Monday, Thursday. Yeah, there was no other Wednesdays that were really strong. But here, Thursday, maxed out. So on these days, people ask me, how do you know the risk more? It's because of the day of week. That's why I'm comfortable. That's why I'm getting. That's where I'm getting the confidence, because I've been back testing it. You don't get that confidence and that courage if you haven't tested the model. That's why I tell people, hey, if you're gonna try the model, try it in demo first. Don't just throw it on your live account, and then you think you know what you're doing, and then you totally mess up the model, and then you point your finger at me like Beyonce. You told me to do that. I didn't tell you to do that. I tell you to do it this way, and I even show videos on how to do it step by step, all the way to the entry and all the way to the profit. That's why I don't want to do the live trading. There's no point in doing it because I'm explaining it. Let's go to the next question. Uh, Columbus, exactly. I would also like a breakdown how you passed phase one. I just talked about it. Phase one, the lot size entered, stop loss. I was fishing basically around like four, four to 5% in one trade. And that's how I passed Columbus on, on the same model. When trying to employ the New York I answer this as well, you can still use the 15 minute swing lows or swing highs that form inside the session as liquidity pools to find an entry. That's the slap boy, Mendy. And then Raphael, please, how long have you been trading the Asian session model? I mean, like I said, I've been trading it for about three to four years. Three to four years. Yep. Now I'm just going to check the the Zoom chat, see if there's questions in there. I've been paper trading. Emmanuel, I've been paper trading on New York model for gold, and it's been ex exciting. I mean, I think it meant exciting. Exciting. Mm -hmm. Thanks, man, for all you do. Yeah, facts. 100%. It's, it's, it's definitely a great model. And I, I don't think anybody should mess it up. Like I said, it's easy enough for a child to learn. It's easy enough for somebody with no experience of trading to understand and comprehend. Oh, and the total amount, grand total, like just taking just the the humble numbers, you know what I mean? The humble numbers, because we don't want to out here telling people we're making all these pips per day and, and fingers are pointed, you know, and I don't want attention, but the humblest numbers for the entire month, 455. Of course, if we include all these other numbers, oh, God, over a 1,000 pips. And people don't want to hear that. There's no way he's making a 1,000 pips. No, I'm not. But I am capturing it in unrealized gains. It doesn't count necessarily, you know. But one day I will make it count. One day I will have the courage to hold a trade without moving my stop loss and paying the trader. I'll hold it. One day I will do it. I, I promise you. I, I will take a trade where I get this and... It will go down in history somewhere, you know, and it'll be a good little funny moment. And we could go all look back and laugh on the Asian session model, you know, and how I was able to do it. It's funny that the model is three steps and it's this simple. Rather, 20 other steps, retail ind indicators, break retests, RSI, moving over, crossing stuff. Do you, do you ever think you see me m using an RSI on my chart? Never. Not bashing anybody that uses it, but why do I need the RSI for? For what? A lagging indicator to tell me, oh, there's a change in. I don't even know how the RSI is made. Like that's so like, I'm so glad I wasn't brought up on retail logic. What the line crosses over, then the other line crosses over, then the candles say this, and then you buy, and then it crosses, and then you sell. No, that's not how it's working. Absolutely not. 
this is probably the closest to the truth that we're going to get because of the entry. And we know we're close to the truth because the entry is way better than other people's entries. We're not trying to brag here, but we just understand that it's closer to what the market is actually really calculating. Because how else was Deontay able to get that entry, hold it enough, hold it for a long period of time to get profit? There has to be something about my entry or the process of how I'm trading that is close to whatever this algorithm is. I don't want to get any closer because what I'm doing is fine. I don't have to stress myself anymore. And I'm so happy. It's the happiest and most profitable years I've had in the last year. The happiest I've been. The less stressful I've ever been trading just because of this model. I used to give I used to give myself headaches, man. I used to be up late at night trading London, forcing it out of my life schedule just because I thought that London is the only session that's the most volatile or the only session that is where the setups are occurring. I need to catch the high today. I need to catch the low today. I don't have to. And you don't either. Unless it fits your life schedule and that session is the only session that you're available to trade in, exploit it, master it, make that your craft. And then explore to the other sessions. I had to master Asian first. And then I started looking at New York and I was like, oh, I can master New York too. And then I have to sacrifice my time, of course, to trade London. And I have recently because it's February and it's time to make money. The big dogs are stepping in now. So it's time to make money. January, as you can see, there's a big taboo about trading Januaries. And I prove that you can trade January and still be profitable. So... That myth is completely nonsense. I just proved it wrong for January 2024. So you can't trade January with a very simple idea. And you can't trade January if the market is definitely ready to move. It's primed to move. And the reason why I'm picking EJ, sorry, AJ. So let's go into some daily bias real quick. Let's look at AJ. So please, please, if you guys can all just do one favor, just watch the daily updates. Watch the daily updates because I really believe in my talent, right? In my expertise. Not saying I'm a professional because I don't have a degree in this stuff. Most it's it's taught, you know, self-taught through, you know, paid mentorship, etc. Taught through other experiences, through reading books and just spending the time looking at the charts and seeing the examples over and over again. And finding those examples when those environments or conditions were met. Watch the daily update videos. I feel like it's the most slept on thing on my channel personally. The most slept on thing because one, it's short. It's like two minutes and it's, it's, it's a quick video. But by the end of the month, you realize, oh, snap. Deontay was able to actually give us a storyline to where price was most likely going to go. I'm not saying I'm going to be right. I'm not telling you to take my trades or take the trades when I tell you, oh, buy after a down day. You don't have to do anything that I'm telling you to do, right? Huge disclaimer. Dude, you don't have to take, I'm not a professional. I'm not a professional. It's not like I'm a certified, certified trader. You know, and I'm licensed for this. I'm not, not licensed for this. Not at all. Looking at this, I I really dislike when I have this on my chart. That's right. I really just, I already got it envisioned and I see it. When I have that in my chart, I really think my chart is messy. I like clean charts. Le the least clutter. At least that's what my personality, my brain works with. The cleaner the chart, for some reason, I feel like I can breathe. I can actually see the chart. It's wonderful. When I have when I start to have a lot of stuff on my chart, a lot starts going on going on, and the ideas are just not coming clean. Clean chart. That might be a good advice or a tip for some of you guys. Clean up the chart a little bit and look at it in very simplistic nature. We talked about how the Bank of Japan negative rate and the Reserve Bank of Australia has a positive rate. So we already are pairing up a strong versus weak 
currency. So this currency pair, I mean, this pair is most likely going to be primed to move in general. It's going to be volatile in general, n not even considering London, New York, or Asian. It's just going to be volatile in general because there's an interest rate differential, period. It's not as strong versus strong. When you have strong versus strong, they equally match. Yes, at, at times, some will, at times, the other currency may outpower the other, but it's so easily and more and much harder for it to defeat the other currency because they're both strong. When it's strong versus weak, ah, this one is dominating. It's boring. Australian dollar is having its way with Japanese yen. But when you put British pound versus dollar together, ah, it's an even match. They have even interest rates. Even if you put Aussie and, 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 and um, DXY together, pretty similar interest rates, right? They're at 4.3. The Fed's at 5.5. .5. It's still pretty close. It's not a big gap. But this is a huge gap. So this market is ready to move. It's antsy, especially in the favor of Australian dollar. That's even before we even get to the charts, guys. The macro information is important. We, we didn't even hit the charts yet. We're just filtering these pairs. I said this for the last couple of years. I said, man, I wonder why nobody's trading in yen crosses. And why is nobody just buying yen? I mean, buying the yen crosses and holding over a long period of time. And I wonder why I haven't been doing it, you know? But when you look at it, month after month, after every down month, strong moves against the yen. Strong moves against it. A down month, the next month was bullish. A down month, the next month was bullish. Then we trend. One down month, then it's really strong bullish. Down month, bullish. We have two consecutive down months. So that's a scenario too. We could have three. We could even have four. But it's most likely returning to some area that it wants to rebalance or some type of PD array. Price sweeps this swing low here. Right there. Sell stop read. Boom, it's gone. Order block theory. Price trades into it. Gone. Down month. Bullish. Trend, trend, trend. Down month. Down month. Trend against it. Small month. Large month. Down month. Look at it again. Down month. Bullish month in January. February. Most likely going to be bullish. We also in what? A small rain cycle. So February could turn into another large candle like this. Right? This June. Look how large June is. How do you catch this large candle? You have to be waiting for a small range to unfold. May was small. So odds are in the near future, the next coming months, one of these months are going to be very larger than May. And the next month, it completed that condition large. And then it jumps right back into what? Small again. This is on the monthly. So you start to see how you can start framing ideas for yourself and start selecting better pairs. You can't just say you're going to trade AU all year round. You just can't. I can't sit here and say I'm going to trade AJ all year round. I can't because there's going to be other pairs that fit better criteria for me to trade. For example, if June was large, would I pick to trade AJ the next month for July? No, I would not. I would have to look at a different pair. I don't want to trade AJ the next month after seeing this large move because I know a lot of excitement is behind this. So everybody, the public eye, has now finally caught on. As soon as as soon as the party is about to finish, the public eye has caught on. Oh my gosh, I should have been buying AJ. But the commercial speculators, the large funds, the market makers, they've already been buying way before retail. By the time retail figures out that they should have been going long, it's too late. And then it pulls back against them. And that's why it always feels like the market is against them. It always feels like, oh, my gosh, it's as if they have a camera in the room or they have some drone flying over me. And they know exactly when I'm buying and selling. They do because they've already psychologically induced you to chase the price action. They've conditioned you. 
as crazy as that might sound, they've they've conditioned you. Think about it. They've conditioned you as a trader to chase the larger candles, especially retail, break retails. They've conditioned traders, retail traders, to chase after large candles. They haven't conditioned traders, retail traders, to stalk after small candles. When I see a small candle, I'm excited. But on the flip side, when the public eye sees a small candle, they're uninterested. They don't want anything to do with it. But as soon as it jumps back large, everybody starts chatting about it. Oh my gosh, bro, did you see gold? Of course I saw gold. And you chased it. I didn't touch it. I waited. And then I got in. How'd you get that entry, Deontay? No way. Because I waited. I would wait weeks. I would wait days. For the right opportunity. That's why the win rate is higher than other people. People are getting better quality trades. People would ask me, how did you get your win rate? Where is that? It's only one video on it? No way. Oh, here it is. Of course, of course, I get the ad for a top tier trader, and I'm taking the challenge. You already know these algorithms are ridiculous. Look on the right. Win rate, 90%. Right? 90%. Why is the win rate 90%? Because the it's a quality trade. Quality trade. The win rate's not 60%. The win rate's not 50 The win rate's not 30%. It's 90%. Is the win rate always 90%? No. Of course, it's not always 90%. It fluctuates. Sometimes it's 88%. Sometimes it's 60%. Sometimes it's 75%. But I don't ever think my win rate, personally, ever drops below 65%. Based on the way I trade. It just doesn't. Because I'm I'm waiting for the best opportunities, the best days to buy. Buying after down months is ideal in a bullish trend on the monthly time frame. Now a hint. Now this is intellectual. This is intellectual thinking. If this is a bullish trend that you see unfolding, in the next month you want to be a buyer. What is the I want somebody to answer this in the chat, see if they can get this one right and see if they answer that if they know what I'm thinking. If next month is going to be a bullish month, how would you go long inside that month? What technique? Besides buying below the monthly open, what technique would you use going into the next month? Sounds confusing, but listen to the question. If you expect November to be a bullish month, how would you go long within November? I'll give it. Okay, that's a good answer. Yes, that's that's a that's a good answer. Not the one I'm looking for, but that is an answer. Buying below the age of session low. That's another good answer, Lenny. Wait for a swing low to print. That's a good answer. Let's see if somebody's got one more. Just one more. I'll give it like five seconds. Five. Buy at the close of the monthly. Good. Buy at the close of the monthly. Okay. That's a good answer too. Come again. So how would you buy? One more time. Price. Good. Yes, good answer too. That's another good answer. But there's one that's even more simpler that I'm thinking about. Think about when I talk about counter trend days. That's a hint. If next month is going to be a bullish month, what should I do to get in trend with that? Think about when I talk about counter trend days. This is just a hint. There you go. Buy after close month. Yeah, you buy. Yeah, you definitely want to buy after a close month. But within that month, what should you do? You're close. Yes, there we go, Lenny. That's the answer I was looking for. Great job, guys. Working with you with that one. 
buy after a down close day. We could see with hindsight, let's play this forward, right? The hindsight here is November. See what how it closes, right? November closes up without me even knowing because we know the logic behind this, right, Lenny? We know the logic. I know you know it. I know you know it. I know all you guys know it. If we know that next month is a is, it finishes up, we can only take an educated guess that at some point of time inside this November candle, out of all those days, out of those four weeks, right? There's at least, right? This is one advanced way. There's at least one or two down weeks or at least one down week. Or there's at least a couple down days. Let's take, let's take a look at this on the weekly first. Let's take a look at this on the weekly. Boop. November to December. Look at that. Right? This is the beginning of November. This is December. Let's take off all these here. Oops, no. You didn't take it off. This, 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 this. Look at this again. Since we know with the hindsight that November closed up, we're taking an educated guess that there is most likely counter trend candles to that monthly that monthly direction. So there must be at least minimal one week that was down. We got that. Wow. How did I know that? Because it's this logic. We know that the market's not going to trend up for all four weeks. Sometimes I'm not sure. I had to double check. You know, actually, there might be times like that as well. The market will trend for four weeks it up. But we know eventually there's going to be a week that's down against the trend. That that down week is how you're going to get into trend. Now we can take it a step further. Right? Well, let's finish this off. There we go, into December. Boom, that down week got you into these two up weeks. Let's take it a step further. Let's go on a daily. Let's go on a daily time frame. This is November. We know it was a bullish month. We took that idea and the educated guess using our intellectual thinking that most likely there's going to be down days inside this month, right? Correct. Look at that. Down day, and it's small. Look how dynamic the next candle is. Dynamic. But look at the logic behind it. It's a down day. We're buying. All off of the context of knowing that going into this month already, I am a I am most likely speculating bullish price action. No matter how you arrive to that conclusion, right? Whether that's technical, macros, fundamentals, whatever it is, that makes you arrive to the conclusion that you're most likely going to lean towards a bullish November, that means you know after down days in November, you should be looking for buys, right? Exactly. So here we go. Friday gives a down day. That Monday, strong. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if there was news on this day. No, there wasn't. Okay. I guess there wasn't. I mean, it might have been, but not ones that trading view is mentioning here. But I wouldn't be surprised if there was some type of news event here. Boom. Price runs large. Again. Down day. Look at this. Down and it's large. Look how it's small, large, small again. This is AJ, guys. Right? It's not like I'm cherry picking and picking specific pairs when it's happening. I'm showing all these pairs doing the same thing. All of them are doing the same thing. Don't get this twisted. They're all doing the same thing. They're all coded the same way. AJ, UCAD, U Swissy, New Zealand dollar versus dollar. It doesn't matter what pair I'm looking at. They're all going to give the same scenarios. It's not that one pair is going to give this fancy, pinnacle, um, so outlandish scenario that no one's ever seen before. They all are giving the same scenarios, guys. You don't need to be a genius to know these things. It just comes with logic and a little common sense. All the pairs are doing the exact same thing in exact different times. In the same way, AJ is showing the same nature of small range versus large range, the same way we see in any other pair. We also can see the buying after down candles in a bullish trend. We see that. We also can see price trading into fair value gaps, huge fair value gaps to the upside, and then trading higher. What do we have right here? Fair value gap. Here, price respects it. 
Swing high. Look at that. Swing high formation. Not confirmed, but still a swing high formation. Fair value got through that. Swing high. Look how price trades into it and runs away. That's that same entry technique that I show you guys on the one minute, guys. The same one minute entry technique is happening here on the daily chart. How is that? Because it's fractal. It's a fractal idea. The market is made up of its own self. From the higher time frame to the lower time frame, it's doing the same thing on every single time frame. It just looks a little larger or a little smaller. It's very easy to see it on the higher time frames, though. That's why I like to tell new traders, study the higher time frame for entry ideas. Because the same entry ideas that you see on the daily that are so obvious, they aren't as obvious on the lower time frame. But since you make yourself so accustomed to seeing it, you start to see these same ideas on the lower time frame. This is that same one minute fair value gap that I show you guys for the Asian session model. It's happening here on the daily. Could you take this as an entry technique? Yes, you can. How would you risk this? Very small. You have to be, you would have to be using a very small lot size because you're look you're trying to you're buying here on the premium side of this fair value gap. As soon as price touch it, you're long. You see the drawdown that you take? You're gonna have to have a very, very small risk. You can't be risking three percent on this pullback. Whoo, three days of selling? That's large, man. Imagine it was deeper than this. So you got to risk small so you're able to hold longer. Sometimes it might be a half standard. Sometimes it might be a micro lot. Right? Or in between a, a half standard and a micro lot. A point twenty, a point thirty. You're not going to be able to hold trades on a higher time frame if you have small equity and you're risking very large. You need to risk small. The larger your equity, the same thing still applies. You might be risking more because you have a larger account, but you're still risking small according to that risk parameter for that equity per 1%, per half trade, per, per half percent. So it's the same thing until you start getting comfortable with figuring out where the best buying opportunity would unfold here. Many ways to break this down. You cut this range in half. Maybe you buy at the mean threshold this busy so you could reduce your risk a little bit. At times, that does cost you for missing a setup. Because what if it just taps it right there at the at the very premium, the very last point the fair value gap dies off at, and then it goes higher? You miss that entry, and you got to live with that. Because you're saying you can't pick it, you can't win at all. But you got to pick something. You got to finally come to a point in your life, in your trading career, where you're like, this is it. And you're hearing this from me. This is it. I'm done. I've learned what I had to learn. And I'm trying to push this into the community as well. I'm trying to push you guys towards the right direction. Yes, there are many ways to look at it, but eventually you need to sit down with yourself and tell yourself, okay, I have troubles with this, this, and this, but I am excellent and I am superb and I'm awesome at looking for these. And every time I do these things, I tend to find the most profit. But every time I do these things, I tend to find the most drawdown and the most losses. So let's try to cut those out. Stop doing those things. Let's do the things you actually excel at. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to reinforce that here. I'm trying to condition people for, I'm trying to hold you guys to a higher standard. Right? right? I don't want anything lesser from anybody doing this. I need you guys to be putting your best foot forward every time you step into the market. Every time you take a trade, could that have been the best trade you could have taken? If so, good job. You know, here flowers, pat on the back. If not, what could you have done better to improve that entry technique? What could I have done better to get into this trend with the least resistant as possible? Buy after a down day. Sell after up day. And that's how we would have been able to capitalize. Right here, one down day. Magic Kitchen is first down day. Right, swing opportunity, Take, taking this as a straight opportunity, because this is how I do it. If I know I'm bullish for this month, I'm waiting for a down day. Okay, D, 
You're going to go long here. Or you go long here. Let's say we pick one, right? We pick one. We want to go long on weakness because it's going down and we prefer a lower buying opportunity instead of buying at the open, buy at the close of this candle. Let's say we're going with that. Price opens. It opens exactly on that on that close too. So we have a as soon as this candle drops, right? We open up either we either we either enter manually, right? When the market comes off from that break, enter manually, or we have a buy limit here already. So price hits the limit, right? Goes down, hits the limit, and then we're in long. And from there on, we hold. Stop loss. Stop loss is going to be anywhere from one to two percent. That's what I'm looking for. A one to two percent trade. At times, it may not be feasible to take the trade because the most recent swing point is too far. It's way too far. So the recent swing point is down here. Now, according to the risk parameter that I'm trying to take, if that swing point is way too far based on the lot size that I have to take on one percent, I have to lower my risk one. Or two, I don't take this trade idea. So I'm most likely going to take the most smallest risk I can take. The most, even if it's a micro lot, even if it's just one standard, I'm trying to take that and hold that. And I'm trying to risk anywhere from two, one to two percent, or even more if I'm more aggressive, anywhere from two to four percent for the swing trade. You gotta have a, you gotta have a basket of risk. You're trying to hold for a couple, couple of days here. You're holding and you're trying to gain three to four percent in the next couple of days, and then some, and, and 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 so on. And then you start to see just from this entry here, price still gives you more than what you asked for. It's not going to be every day scenario where you're going to find the swing trades, it's difficult. You got to wait. These are things you got to be patient. If you're a swing trader, you got to be patient for these things. Got to be patient for these things. But here, that's how we would get into trend. Down days. Another down day here. Another down day. Up, up. Down day, loser. Down day, loser. Down day, winner, 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 winner. Down day, winner. Down day, winner, winner. Down day, winner. Down day, you're done with the month. You're done. And we would use if to look back data ranges around here to see if there's any sensitive price points. Could we find a lower entry to lower the risk at some point? Yes, we use all those things. You see our price almost get down to this down candle here for the bullish order block theory. I think it just does. Nope, it just misses it. See, it just misses that order block. But it's still a very safe buy. You can see how it almost gets there, taps it, almost taps it, creates a double bottom, and then runs higher. Then double bottoms. Interesting. And price AJ keeps trending. Strong trend. Just, just looking at this trend, though, look at how every after every down day, you had a greater chance of being a winner if you just took the side of being a buyer. But we can't arrive to those ideas and these simplistic ideologies without understanding. We just can't. If you don't know how to read trend, you don't know how to read price action, you'll never be able to take advantage of these simple ideas of buying after a down day. Well, how did you know to buy after a down day? Well, because I know that the market is bullish. That's the answer. Well, how did you know to sell after an up day? Because I know the market is bearish. And I know that the market gives this pattern over and over again. That's the scenario. In a bullish trend, when you roll the dice, when the algorithm is gearing itself to roll the dice, and the day before it is down and it's in a bullish trend, drilling the dice is probably going to show me another bullish day. And it happens very often. Every time I roll the dice after a down day in a bullish trend, I tend to always be right. Not all the time, but probably more than 65% of the time, I'm always right after buying after a down day. Very simple idea. Now, if you have any other questions, it is now 1151. It's about to be midnight. If you have any questions, please let me know. I think I answered and covered all the questions as much as possible. 
And if there's still any confusion, be feel free. Shoot me a DM. I'll get right back to you as soon as possible. I think this is another successful Forex Fridays with Deontay. Yeah. Another long one. Same ideas, but just a different pair. We got to throw these different examples in front of everybody's faces because they need to know that it's not just the pair that they're looking at. It's not just the pair Deontay happens to pick. It's all of them. Every single last one of them. All of them are doing it. Every single one. So if you have any other questions, please let me know. If not, I'm going to tell you guys good night. Safe trading. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your work day. Whatever you do in life, enjoy it. And I'll see you back on Monday. My pleasure. Anytime. All right. Good night, everybody. Peace. Thank you for your time as well. My pleasure.